Hey everybody on YouTube, what is going on? I know you can barely see me tonight because I'm wearing camouflage, but that's okay. We got our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection happening tonight. I know all of you are pumped up. I am pumped up. It is Wu Train time, people. Wu Train time. Who's not, who doesn't get excited for a little Wu Train time? Be honest. Put your hands up. If you don't like Wu, you're not probably in the wrong building. I'm telling you that right now. Let's say hello to everyone here so far. Second night in a row in the gold medal position. We have race fans. Silver for Solaire. Renee, the gorgeous one, taking home the bronze. Hey, Joshua on Jurassic Joey, good to see you. The Ronald Penton is here, everyone. The Ronald Penton. James Horn and Commonwealth Andrew and Aiden, good to have you guys here. Hey, Jack, Dirt Road, Ross, and Justin, thanks for coming on in. Big Bad Ed, there he is, everyone, and Jurassic Joey, good to see you. One of my beautiful wrenches, Denali Princess, a.k.a. Princess Denali. Hey, Phil C., Mark Steam Train. Yeah, Mark Steam Train, I went there. How's tomorrow looking? Please let us know if we are alive or not. Oh, there she is, everyone. The gorgeous and talented Steph Dickey from Florida. Ken from Texas. You're looking pretty gorgeous tonight as well. Hey, Steve Stockton, Project Blue Book, Football Cat, Millennium, Kings of Kvist. Oh, there she is, everyone. Give a round of applause for Alaska's greatest athlete, the gorgeous and talented Emily Bigelow. There she is. Give us a wave, Em. Give us a wave. All right. Uh, opa, to you, Greco. How you doing, man? And uh, Cherry Pepsi Mike. What is happening? How's your clip-on tie tonight? Great, uh, great to see you there, Greg and uh, Greg and Pol Pot and Richard Elmore, Doctor Marty. Thanks for coming on in, Michael Lestuka. Good to see you, man. Uh, hi, Pam. I am Pam. I am Pam. You are Pam. I am Pam. You're looking lovely tonight, Pam. And I'm looking lovely tonight. I am Pam. Moving on up, where are we? Paul Holland and the gorgeous Helena, thanks for coming on in. And uh, uh, Cherry Pepsi Mike, uh, to your last statement, please go ahead. Uh, Blue Line Bigfoot, welcome to our chat room. Thank you for joining us. Major Lee, Sig Sauer, Murray F., you're looking all awesome tonight. Thank you for joining us. And as we go on, uh, there's the gorgeous and talented Teresa. She will be signing autographs after the show. Please line up to the right of the studio, the right of the studio. And uh, we'll continue on here as uh, waiting for everybody else to get here. And uh, yeah, our right, Keith, how you doing, man? Not bad at all. How about you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm going riding in the morning. Pretty happy about that. So are we going road and riding horse or motorcycle? Uh, side by sides, like ATVs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aiden, good to see you, man. Uh, oh, you know what? We're gonna throw Sig Sauer in on the on signing autographs tonight. Sig Sauer, hope you don't mind, but after the show, we need you to stick around to sign autographs for all the folks. Line up to the left for Sig Sauer. Line up to the left. Teresa on the right. Sig Sauer on the left. Uh, we want you on our show, Dave Scott. Blue Line? Yeah, sure. I'll do it. Hold on. Let me give you my email. Send me a message. Yeah, I'll totally do it. <clears throat> no, just going out riding and having some fun. Hey, Otis. Otis hasn't signed autographs yet, too. Line up down the middle for Otis. Otis will be signing autographs on the middle. Teresa to the right. And Sig Sauer on the left. We're all booked up. Rob and roll, man. Rob and roll right there, buddy. That's my good buddy. Noble Patrick, good to see you. Hey, R. Keith in the chat room. Jeremy Jones, Stu Gerson. Stu F. and Gerson is here, everyone. Right there. Good to see you, Stu. All right. We got like uh, oh, just a little bit here. I'll start that up. <clears throat> Randy is huge. I'm not Randy Quaid anymore, man. I'm not Randy Quaid anymore. I shaved. That was funny, though. There was one picture that really made me laugh. Really made me laugh. Uh, how is Joe Diamond? Joe Diamond, by the way, guys, I took in his show. He was fantastic. 
Oh my God, he was fantastic. I highly suggest you go to Joe Diamond Live. Check it on out. All right. Good way to support this show. We got the super chat open. Hi, Ronnie. How are you? Uh-oh, Gail's messaging me already. Hey, sweetie, you probably already know, but your lips aren't synced. Try hitting reset. Gail, that's all you got to do is hit reset. Uh, sometimes it does that. And uh, might be one of those nights. Uh, all right, let's uh, get this going. 15 seconds. Super chat is open. Hit that thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. Thank you to all our new subscribers. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Our Keith Andrews in five seconds. mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world here's this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl if you want to take a listen to our archives they are free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio just do old davy the favor hit that subscribe button you can follow us on twitter at spaced out radio and on instagram at spaced out radio show our website is spaced out radio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time of the month once again, and how do you not get excited for this? Our good friend, our Keith Andrews, is back with the ET Connection. Keith is a lifelong ET contact. He discusses the purpose of aliens coming to Earth and having contact with us. Keith is not only a contactee, but he's also highly intuitive, and he's seen over, what is it now, 70 extraterrestrial races somewhere around there? Somewhere over that at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, the best benefit of Keith, he's got one heck of a good set of pork chop sideburns. They are fantastic. I love them. Keith, welcome back, man. Well, thank you so much for having us. I appreciate it. I'm glad to, have to see everybody in the chat room. Boy, is it ever active. Oh, yeah. I have no idea how you track these guys. I don't know. I don't know. Especially Cherry Pepsi Mike, you know, because every time he comes in, he's got a new clip on bow tie or tie because he doesn't know how to tie a tie so you know i mean we got to watch out for people like him because they're slick and they're smooth but that's okay that's okay we like to have fun with them hey keith there's a lot of people who tune on in each month we always get new listeners explain your life story how you got into this weird world man well in a nutshell the day i was born i flatlined and ran into the ran in ran into the grand council at that point and, I mean, it started off well enough. Ended up being a medium right from the get-go. But by the time I was two, we were having complications, and I ended up being introduced to the MyLabs, which led me down an interesting path that put me in touch with the off-worlders altogether, the first group of which would have been the Strasazium, which are your eight and a half, seven and a half to eight and a half foot reptilians. Okay, it was literally at their hands that I ended up surviving. So I went from from the real negative the real negative abductions. That was at the hands of the Talons, which are the ant like people that inside that some of you have had the uh, I don't know if I want to call it pleasure or displeasure of meeting, but went from that to becoming a cult, a, a consultant to them, to the to the consortium itself. And the most recent run-in was I got taken the other day. I, I When I'm talking the other day, about three weeks ago now, got taken up for a very involved conversation. You know, a very in, involved discussion with them. Found out they're not exactly, shall we say, as 
um, as polite or as civilized as they would like most people to think. But it's like I keep telling people. The biggest difference between between humans and the off-worlders is their toys. They still have the same social complications. This is evidenced by the fact that they've got wars up there, too. If they had it all figured out, they wouldn't. But I've been dealing with, well, to date, I think it's somewhere in excess of 70 at this point. I'm in the middle of working on the, on the second volume. Right, the first one was 60, and I think I've got I think I've got 30 now that I've documented, and another dozen or so that I've still got to add to the to the second volume. For you being a lifelong contactee, the way you are, how do you know if someone is a contactee? What signs do they give you? The sad reality of it is they feel it, and I do mean that quite literally. When when I meet somebody. I can feel whether or not there's a, a shift in their energy pattern that they've gone through something bizarre. Okay. You know, there is no real cut and dried, here you go, look at this, and that's what you and you've got an abductee. Because it really boils down to more their bearing, their reaction, the way they explain what they've been through. There are certain things that do stand out. Like for instance, when they're trying to describe something to me you know, about something they've gone through, the terminology they're using, the way they're exp explaining something, usually will tell whether or not they've been dealing with things they really don't know. Like what? Yeah. Give, give us an example. Well, for instance, when I first started, started dealing with my abductions and the memories started coming back real solid, I described a room that I was in as being a room full of, of there was all sorts of walls of lights and toggles and, and you know, and reel to reel tapes, you know, and switches and what have you. Well, looking at it at, at the time I was looking at it, that's what I was describing it as. When I got looking at it a little later, a little more in depth, what I was looking at was mainframe computers from back in the 60s, which were nothing like the ones we got today. You know, when you're explaining, when you're trying to explain the the size of somebody that you're only coming up to their, to their hip on, you know, they, there's no way of gauging height at that point aside from going, well, it was double my height. You know, people that are that are going, well, when I was a kid, you know, I'm reliving this memory and they were this size, you know, they were exactly this size, or they had this specific type of weapon or or art, you know, article. You start questioning whether or not they have actually whether or not they are actually remembering it or whether they're trying to fit they fit it in. And the biggest issue is the way they carry themselves will be different. Like it will feel, there'll be something that feels off on it. Of course, the problem here is I'm an empath, which simply means I physically pick up on what people feel. So if they're not feeling, if they're feeling off or if they're trying to, you know, if they're trying to lie about it, it stands out like a sore thumb for me. In your passing, through this timeline where you're dealing with a lot of ET contacts, do you notice that it's majority of young people who are having contact? Is it people in their middle ages, young adults, seniors? Who's having the most? The most, I would have to say, are likely, well, kids get a staggering number of them, but you get a, a real large percentage that fall into the late teens, early 20s. Right, which are right at their formative, formative um, cultural years is what I think they're aiming at. I haven't exactly been told why they're aiming at that. Like there are a number of seniors, but usually the seniors are long-term, long-term abductees. You know, you don't get many first-time abductees that are senior citizens. I've seen it happen in a couple of cases, but only a couple. Okay, what's the purpose of taking seniors, especially, you know, considering they're in the late stages of their own lives? 
Well, because there is something that the off-worlders recognize and humans seem to have overlooked a lot of. And that is, if you're trying to get an overall picture of, of cultural evolution, the seniors have a unique and rather staggering amount of insight. Okay, they've, obviously they've gone through life for a while. And you got to remember that the way these people, that these off-worlders operate, the information they're looking at can be brawn drawn out of the DNA. Because the records are all right there. Mankind does not know how to pull the records yet, and that's where the where a lot of the conflict comes in. Strange. I thought it would have been in the younger people. I would have. But uh, let's kick off with a question right here from Blue Line Bigfoot. What do you know about the lava men? Um, well, they're fire they're they're basically fire elementals that decided to take residence in inside Ita, Mother Earth. They are not off-worlders, not by technical definition. They evolved here. However, that being said, um, how do I put this? Lava Man, they evolve on many different planets because of the fact that they literally are magma or magma that has become sentient. You know, so... If you're if you're looking for a ship for them, don't. Once they settle in, once they are birthed in a in a given planet, that's where they stay. And okay. to the best of my knowledge, nobody picks up lava and tries to move it to another planet and transplant it. Okay, Greco has a question: Is humanity being groomed to serve a greater purpose not yet realized to us? but yet known to the extraterrestrials? Um, only in a sense. Mankind is being guided to try and get them aware of the extraterrestrials, but it's not for a greater, greater purpose. It really boils down to this. Teach the kids getting out of the sandbox how to operate in the big world. That way we don't have as many problems. But... Mankind is on an evolutionary path to a much bigger, to a much bigger purpose that mankind is not aware of. What is that? Okay. What is that? Well, ironically enough, and I call it ironic, is you've seen the state of the world, the amount of conflict we've got. Well, the ironic part of it is mankind is one of the few races that has the capacity to take that aggressive tendency find a way to actually bring it into a peaceful state and then take that and spread it out there because clearly they missed the boat on whether or not there should be war. Mankind has the capacity to actually bring peace, not only to its own planet, but to the people out there. Makes sense. All right, let's get uh, to another question here from Greg, who is asking, do the merfolk... Merman. I'm a merman. Do the merfolk ever leave their caves to visit the surface anymore? All the time. Okay, they have learned how to be a little bit more secretive about it to avoid things like, shall we say, sonar. But when you're dealing with away from the away from the um from submarines and what have you that operate with sonar all the time. They do come out and about, you know, to see what's going on. Every now and again, it's it's kind of comical, because every time now and again on the on the cruise ships, people will go along and they'll see dolphins jumping. You can bet your bottom dollar periodically you'll find a merman diving with them. Hmm. I never knew that. Let's go over to Sparkles in the Space Travelers Club. How do the discussions take place when you have interaction with so many species? Are they verbally or telepathic or a combination of both? If verbally, what do their voices sound like? Well, okay. Now, number one, it's a combination of both. Plus, there is some semantic, uh, as in hand signals and what have you, that they work with. 
as for the what they sound like, you're looking at everything from hisses and growls to normal, normal sounding, if you will, human like voices. You know, and then you've got your clicks, pops, and beeps. I mean, it's a it's an absolute cacophony if you if if people don't if they don't keep a handle on it, which is one of the tasks of the of the council. They'll have somebody there that is simply going, okay, you can speak now, because otherwise nobody hears anything. Because you got to remember, the acoustics in their meeting halls are much better than than the ones we've got here, except from what I gather, the um, the Grand Ole Opry apparently has a real good setup. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's move on here. Uh, Football Cat is asking, what do you think actually happened to the hikers at Dietlob Pass? Well, unfortunately, I don't have a definitive answer there. I would be inclined to say that they likely, if I recall correctly, and if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Dave, um, those hikers just essentially vanished without a trace. No, they were all found dead. There was like nine of them. Oh, okay. There's another one that disappeared. Um, the odds are, because I didn't actually look into that one at all. Mind you, as I've mentioned to people before, I don't research them. Right. All right. Well, we can move on. Dr. Marty, R. Keith, what, do you, what can you tell us about intelligent aquatic life in Lake Bacal, Siberia? Well, I can certainly tell you it exists. Um, and again, this is where it gets to be really outside of, if you will, my run, because I don't actually look into these. But that being said, if you're dealing with aquatic life, number one, all, all underwater life is not man-sized. Okay, there's a lot of things that are, that are definitively sentient. Um, I was looking at one. I'm trying to remember what the heck the name of it was, but there is one group, and I can I'd lay odds that they're probably in there. But um, there is a race of sentient sponges, and I do mean that quite literally, as in sea sponges. But I don't know what people are running into up there. All right, let's move on. Greco is asking, Keith, have you found out why the extraterrestrials hold you in such high regard or importance? The best way I can look at it is I don't see a difference between an individual, a human individual, and an individual from any other race. Okay, it doesn't make any difference what race they are, what station they are. Heck, I, I've told some of their leaders what they could do with their ideas because they were completely wrong. Because their assessment of the human race was completely bass backwards. And apparently you're not supposed to do that. You know, I, I told one, I told I literally told one group of reptilians that if they were too cowardly to go and rescue their own people, then I'd deal with it for them. They did not take kindly to that comment. Mind you, they also didn't kill me or argue the point. Well, Which is better than what I can say for humans. Well, that's good. Well, I thought so. That yeah, is I'm definitely good. I'm not ready to, ready to die yet. At least not again. No, that wouldn't be fun. That wouldn't be fun. No, but it is comical looking at the look on people's faces when you get up after they tell you you're that you're past. True. True. Blue Line is asking, what's the connection between Bigfoot and UFOs? Um, well, they're both unknown. <laughs> Bigfoot is, and this Dave and I have gotten into this one a number of times, but there is a race of, and there is a race called the Wara that look very similar to, to Bigfoot. They are off-worlders. But Bigfoot, as in what we know as Bigfoot and Yeti and what have you, are victims of, abduct of abduction of the UFO community as well. Primarily because they're another sentient race for, that happens to be, you know, that happens to be here. 
And much like much like Terran scientists, these offworlders do collect various members of various races. Like the the abductions are not just against humans. I think there is a connection between the two. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Too many people have seen Bigfoot starting running away when UFOs have come around. Well, as I said, Bigfoot does get abduct uh, abducted. And the thing with the UFOs is they've got the technology to spot them even in, in spite of their ca of the Bigfoot's natural camouflage. All right, Michael Lestuka is asking, uh, as we got about three and a half minutes, Keith, what's his thoughts, what's your thoughts, Keith, of the secret space program? Do you think there's a galactic war going on right now as well? Oh, there's definitively a galactic war going on. As for the secret space program, um, would you believe me if I said I didn't consider it all that secret? Mankind is building an extra, is, is actually in the process of developing technology to move, a, to move an asteroid in a geosynchronous orbit around the moon in order to build a starship factory there for interstellar travel. And the reason for it is simple. It's a lot easier to build it up there than it is to launch them from ground afterwards. All right. Sparkles is asking, do you think you can understand fully what the clicks and beeps mean when communicating with ETs? Do you have a special ability to understand it all? Um, understand them fully? Definitively not. But get enough of it to work with? Absolutely. Special ability is simply a question of being of two factors. One, I've been doing it for an awful lot of years. And two, I'm what is called an uncontrolled telepath. Meaning I can pick up their intentions, you know, their, the meaning behind it. And quite often I'll understand what they're, what they're talking about without them uttering a single word. Okay. Lexi is asking, did the different races on Earth, like Asian, Caucasian, African, originate from different alien species or hybrids of different races? Only technically. Okay, and what I mean by that is mankind evolved on Earth. It is not a seeded planet, a seeded race. But they were accelerated by what you would consider a, an alien race because, well, they got here and, you know, they, they were here and they... The planet got here before they did, and they ended up jacking the DM, tweaking the DNA. Quite frankly, of the of the of the chimpanzee and a few other of of the uh, of the apes, in order to accelerate the evolution of man, and here we are. But man itself evolved here to start with. All right, let's sneak in one more question. Andrew is in the UK is asking if the aliens have an LBGTQA plus community. Um, not exactly. And the reason for it is they don't segregate them. They don't, I mean, you, you pick your partner as you choose. They also don't worry about interspecies. If you want to hook up with somebody, knock yourself out. They just don't see that as a, as a relative community. All right. Well, do we get in another commercial? No, let's just uh, go to commercial break here. I'll hold it right there so that way we don't miss any. And our Keith Andrews, the ET Connection, is on board. It happens once a month, right near the beginning, where we get a little comfortable, we get a little cozy, and Keith has his, his uh, Doc Andrews uh, hair going on. So it looks all good. The ET Connection. Our Keith Andrews. Your questions, if you're in the chat room or on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio for our resident ET expert. Next, on Spaced Out Radio. All right, we're clear. We are. Well, I got my coffee right here. I kept it away from the Look table. Look at that. Look at that.
Hard to believe, man. Hard to I'm believe. I'm slow learning, but I try. You are totally there. Yeah, I managed to get my managed to get my little brother got him the money to help him buy his house. Oh, nice. You know, so I mean, when my the, the neat part is when my estate came in, mm -hmm. I managed to help three people save their houses. Well, two save their house and one one actually get one, and still get out of <clears throat> get get completely out of debt. That's good. Give me one second here, because my chat room is going to jump here. Now I'm going to go back up and find it. I hate when this happens. I refreshed and kicked forward. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. <laughs> you read Joe Monk, sir? Oh, I, I don't even know where I am in the chat room right now. I'm oh. trying to find a all I know is the question that I'm looking for. Uh no, Joe, where the heck did it go here? Um, Joe, what the heck? I can see why you have trouble. I'm getting there. Can't find it now. But anyway, what Joe said, he goes, I have spe I have special Pepsi. It it has you know it it has um what the heck was it? It, has, it has basically Bacardi in it. Nice, nice. I think that's what he called it. Yeah, I have no idea how the hell you track these. Ah, uh, I just move on. Sometimes, uh, I don't know. Hey guys, I just want to remind you that I've seen a few questions already not in capital letters. Do me the favor, put your questions in capital letters if you're in the chat rooms. It's much easier for me to read because remember, I, I'm ha the chat room moves real fast on YouTube. Uh, everybody else who's been here a while, they kind of know that I need them. It's easier for me to see. And uh, reminder that I'm, I'm basing this off of three chat rooms and Twitter. So, or four chat rooms in Twitter, I apologize. So, uh, if you could just do me that favor, I'd really appreciate it. It helps me out a lot. All right. Yeah. Joe's Pepsi has Bacardi. Uh, Which isn't too terribly bad, really. Personally, the biggest flaw there is I don't like, is I don't like Pepsi too terribly much. I haven't had one since June 1st. Actually, May 31st. That was the last one. Yeah? Yeah. I haven't had a drink since last Christmas. I did have a shot of Fireball yesterday. Went out playing in the snow. Oh, yeah. See, I was quite happy with the snow here this, this year. We had two heavy snowfalls. I'm sure I saw three snowflakes. Oh, you're lucky. I still got about, uh, in places in my backyard, I still got like seven, eight, nine inches, man. Of snow that's why i live down here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i i went in, when we're, where we were in the uh in the hills yesterday there were there were parts we weren't way up there but there were parts where there were still two three feet yeah no you can have it no, it's, it's melting lightning. it's melting it's a bad combo <laughs> All right, uh, let's see here. We got about a minute. And uh, thank you so much to Greco and to Murray for those awesome super chats. Really do appreciate that. And uh, we've got about one minute here before we're going to kick off the second half hour of the show. And um, let's see here. Oh, let's see. There's a Shira 7, not a Shira 6 or a Shira 8. She prefers a 7. She's a 7. Okay. Uh, just letting everybody know. All right. 30 seconds. Oh, Cat Chaser, thank you so much for that wonderful super chat. Wonderful way to support what we do. 
Don't forget, if you're new, hit that thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs sideways. And if you're new, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We'd greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. We're going to get going here in about 10 seconds. We're going to stick with your questions. I'm way behind, everyone, so I'll try and catch up here as quickly as possible. Here we go. Second half hour of Space Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us in. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our Keith Andrews, the ET Connection, continues right now. Keith, we're going to start off with a question from Joe in California. Are any of these alien races going to step out of the shadows and let the people know they exist, or are they going to continue to hide like a bunch of little cowards? Well, that's a cute thought. Um, some of them already have, but in answer to your question, you really don't want them to. I mean, everybody talks about it, but the reality of it is this. Humans are a naturally skittish and apparently aggressive race. Therefore, stepping out, I mean, it's one thing having a, having a basically human-looking in a race step out. It's another to have some of the others, like, for instance, the Udina. Mankind would go absolutely into a panic, and this is why they are not actually permitted to reveal everything in, in, um, in public, as it were. Because if aliens were to all of a sudden show up en masse and just eliminate the question of, are we alone, mankind's entire societal, societal structure would collapse, including the religious community. And we know how that goes backwards. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about one religion. I'm talking about across the board. Makes sense. All right, let's get over to Will's question. Uh, let's hear more about these reptilians. Do they have a bone of compassion in them? The Strazazians are actually allies of humans. Um, do they have compassion? The answer is yes. The Chitwari are not, they are reptilian, but they're not off-worlders. They evolved here. Okay. The Teklek, not really that much in the way of compassion on the whole, although they've got a civil war because they're not happy with the with the leadership. Okay. Tormanon, no. Compassion is not their strong suit. They are mercenaries. They do what they're paid to do, and they don't question it. And, of course, the Drakes is not a question of whether they have compassion. It's a question of they figure they're better than every other race. Not just humans. They're just playing better than everybody. All right. Let's get to Deep Thoughts question. What's an alien's favorite drink? Which alien? Oh, and I don't just mean just give us race. a few. I mean, which just, alien? Just give us a few. I mean, like, what are the greys like? What are the mantids like? Well, the greys are very, very much into your into your flower drinks, things. I mean, they are quite content with, like, honeymead would be the closest thing that, that mankind does. But they've got a drink that they, that they brew from their version of honeysuckles. Okay, you name the, the herb. I mean, around here, dandelion tea works really nice for them. When you start looking at the mantis... The, the mantis are much more into a, shall we say, slightly more viscous drink that's closer to, oil, closer to a fatty oil than it is anything else. Okay. Um, definitely not what I would consider. I mean, it reminded me when I tried it the one day, it reminded me more of castor oil than anything else. Which might give you an idea that their taste buds are not what I consider decent. All right, let's, let's, let's move on here. Let's get over to Kat's question. 
She is asking, she's from Paranormal Heart Podcast. Keith, what do you know about the dog man? What do you think it is? Alien or human creation? My understanding of it is that it is probably, it, it is likely off-worlder. Probably out of Sirius. Okay, I do not, it does not feel like a human creation or a human mutation for that matter. Okay, and from what little I know about it, its diet is distinctly not human. Interesting. Because on the, on the whole, it's carnivorous. It does look very carnivorous. What do you think about these telepathic messages creatures like Dogman or, or Bigfoot seem to give people, especially hunters who are armed? You know, when they raise a rifle to these creatures, people tend to get this telepathic message that basically says... You know, that's not a really good idea to be doing that. Well, with Bigfoot with Bigfoot giving off that kind of an emana of an emanation, it would absolutely make sense. They're not exactly an aggressive race. Dogman, quite frankly, my understanding of it is you're more likely to get done in than you are to get warned. You know, you pull a gun on them and they're likely to they're they're more likely to react than they are to try and negotiate. Very true. Very, very true. All right, Grandmaster is asking, where do you think all the alien bases are in our solar system? Well, let's see. You've got at the sun, like they're literally inside the sun's photosphere. Um, there is a base, there is a, a contact point on Vulcan. Which, by the way, is a planet inside the sun's photosphere. It's not. It's not full of green men. Okay, Vulcans are actually a crystalline race, um, and of course, the moon itself is chock full of them. Okay, on what we call the dark side of the moon, which, trust me, is not dark. That's you because know, of the sun shining from the back, and the exactly. front and the front is a reflection. Essentially, yeah. Hmm. You know, of course, there are a number of bases on Earth. And no, before you go there, I am not about to start giving giving locations. of the Come on, give us a location, Keith. Yeah, come on, not. Come on, give us yeah, one. Give us one. Theory. Huh? Give us one. No. Okay, half of one. Okay. If you look around on Earth, you'll find them somewhere. All right, Keith, where's the tunnel in your house? Because you're on a... You're on a first-level condo, all right? Where's the tunnel in your house to get to the base? Yeah, not going to happen. I know there is one. and I may be making that up, but I get the feeling by your body reaction right now that I'm looking at, you have a tunnel in your house. Yeah, but it ain't physical. So you have a portal. That'd be going to the point. Cool. Can you open it right here? No. Why? Well, technically, I could, presumably, except for the room I'm in, is at the, is at the wrong end of the house for where I have it. Well, go get it. Uh, it ain't that small or that easy to move. Much more importantly, it creates absolute havoc with electronics. All right. All right. Break our hearts. Break our hearts. Pretty much. Lexi is asking... Are there humans or any alien races living in the hollow earth? Yes. To both those questions. Where's hollow earth? Well, there's two access points I can think of that are easy to get to. Well, sort of. North and South Pole. I mean, heck, the South Pole used to have an entire civilization built around one. Well, I shouldn't say it was a civilization, and I'm going to have to put that on. Yeah, you go do that. You go do that, Keith, and then uh, you. I'll just talk with the audience here for a little bit. Keith is actually on duty right now. That's the phone that you actually heard him him uh, ring there. So he's on duty for work for another 15 minutes and tries to sneak us on in here. But uh, we will try and get to more of your questions uh, regarding this. So I'm just going to move up in the chat room 
right now, and uh, we'll get you to repost after the break. But with Keith, the way he does things, just so you guys understand, if you're new, wondering, this is way too much woo. I mean, this is like taking a needle of vaccination woo and just shooting it into his arm and shooting it into your arm to make things happen. Oh, is he still on the phone? Are you still no, on the phone? Not. You're done? Okay, well, that was quick. We're not off shift yet, but that was just checking numbers. Oh, okay. Look at that. Look at that. And I went and jumped through my entire chat there. All right, uh, let's get to uh, Ashira Seven's question. Gorgeous Ashira, Ashira Seven. She likes to be known that way. What is their purpose for you, there being the aliens? They are, as near as I can understand it, they are, number one, trying to get a handle on how humans think and why humans are so bound and determined to figure out if they're real when they can't tolerate each other. It's, it's a conundrum to them. Plus, of course, they, uh, I end up dealing with them a lot to help them get along with each other. Again, it boils down to, I don't see a difference in any of them. I mean, physical configuration languages, certainly. But I don't see a difference in anybody's worth, which is probably why I've run into problems with, with various different bosses over the years. Well, you are a rebel that way. All right, Ryushin is asking, why have the aliens been hiding? Have they been eating human beings? Well, um... Some of them, yeah. As far as why hide, it's because of the fact that they are under very strict orders that they are not to disrupt the natural evolution of mankind, of mankind civilization. Okay, this is that and the fact that mankind has a, on the whole, has a really dangerous habit of doing one of two things. They either, you know, they'll stare for a bit but more often than not, they scream and run in terror, or they open fire and go, are you friendly? Which doesn't work well. All right. You know, but, you know, but the, the biggest issue is they are not supposed to, they're supposed to do their best. In spite of the research, they are supposed to do their best to avoid disrupting mankind's evolutionary path. Greco is asking... Does humanity have any ancient alien enemies? Um, not that you have to worry about. See, centuries back, and we are talking in the thousands of years, there was conflict, and mankind did run into a snag with the Atlanteans. Mankind has run into, into troubles with the Amazonians in the past, but... What it sounds like we're asking if there's any that may be coming back to cause a problem for man, and not that I'm aware of. Uh, I mean, there are a couple of races that you definitely don't want to be dealing with, hmm. you know, primarily because it's just not all that, all that um, sociable, I think, is the best way to put it, the best way to put it. All right, let's get to another question from Greco. Do any aliens feed off of paranormal energy? If so, who? Shadow walkers. They feed off fear. Shadow walkers are also known are also what you would know as psychic vampires. Of course, there is a strain of shadow walkers that are true vampires, which means they feed off of off of iron based blood. Oh, those are those are two of them. The Orions react to it because the Orions are rather empathic, and of course the Venusians don't exactly feed off it, but they certainly draw on it. All right, Uncle Dale has a question: Do any alien species have more or less than two sexes? Yes, there are some that are that are amorphous. Like the Corlock, for instance, only have, they've got one sex. And, and, well, I don't know how you'd put this. They switch sexes, depending on what they're up to. Okay, but there, there are a couple of races, and I'm actually in the middle of trying to document that. Um, I know of one 
that actually has three sexes, which would be male, female, and other, which makes their whole mating process a very complicated setup and completely incompatible with humans. Mind you, the Corlocks are incompatible with humans. All right. Devin is asking, do ETs have video game equivalents? Do they enjoy recreational fiction? I like that question. Yeah, I like that one, too. And the answer is definitively yes. The difference between their video games and, and modern Terran video games is they use a holographic interface. And they have, when we talk about full 3D, we're talking fully immersible 3D that can actually kill you. A little extreme, you know, it's a little bit on the more intense side for the extreme gamer. Very true. Very true. All right. Let's go to another question here. Knucker is wondering if aliens like hockey, and if so, what's their team? That would be, you know, this is the sad part. That depends on the alien. It's not a racial thing. Some of the aliens like hockey, some don't. And if you're asking me teams, I barely know. I barely know half a dozen teams at best. Well, I can tell you this. From my experience, I have not met an alien yet that likes the Toronto Maple Leafs. And that's all <laughs> that matters. That's all that matters. They're tired of watching their networks, and all they see is Hockey Night in Canada, TSN, Toronto this, Toronto that, Toronto this, Toronto that, forgetting that there's an entire universe of hockey out there. So I'll answer that one. Yeah. All right, moving on. Blue Line wants to know, do aliens poop? And if so, what do they do with the waste? That depends on the race and the technology, but the, the short answer is, on the whole, yes. And in most cases, it is recycled. There are some that just dump it in the space and, near, and let, it let gravity take it to the nearest star. And then, of course, you got the, the, you've got those other wonderful races that actually use it as a dietary supplement. All right. Let us move on here. And Football Cat is asking, do off-worlders look down on humans for eating meat? Not in the slightest. An awful pile of the off-worlders that I know of are either omnivorous, meaning both, both vegetable and meat, or strictly carnivorous. There are, you know, humans get more flack about not eating only meat. Or the, the bigger one that really kicks off some of them is why don't you eat your dead instead of burying it in the ground? Well, I mean, let's face it. They need to know pretty much that bacon is one of the greatest things that's ever happened to humans <laughs> and this planet. So I can't see an alien getting pissed off about bacon. I don't think... It's not that they mind the bacon. It's like, don't understand why, why, you, why humans bury humans. Why humans bury humans? Because we're dead. That's the point. Oh, they were... half the oh, I see where you're going with that. I see where our Keith is going with that. <laughs> They're looking at us as a free meal. Once the... Well, you look at the Srazazians, for instance. Let's say you're at dinner and your grandpa keels over and dies. If he didn't die by disease, mm -hmm. he slipped onto the dinner table. And everybody says, "Thanks, Grandpa. Glad you were here. Dinner time." Cannibals, cannibals. That's cannibals. what they are. Uh, all cannibals right, carrying that sort of thing. All right, moving on here. Uh, Greco wants to know because he has a Greek restaurant just outside of Toronto. He is asking, "Do aliens like clam chowder?" Because I guess he probably makes a good clam chowder. I'm going to assume. Many of them, the answer is yes. And I mean, really, when you think about it, the merfolk prefer it, prefer it cold, but they absolutely prefer the seafood and the seafood meals. All right. Susan is asking, are there alien species protecting us? So we got yes. about four and a half minutes. Yeah, the big one, and they're literally big. The Strazazians are literally protectors of humanity. 
the the greys are are very protective of what they call their research material you know so they I mean, and of course the consortium itself has a, has a definitive guideline that earth is a protected planet it's not a quarantine planet but it is protected it's only a half quarantine right now <laughs> yeah but that's not they're doing oh true true go on I, I apologize for oh not a problem <laughs> you know but yes you know man, humans do have allies you know not the least of which is the mobians right now in all fairness mobians are humans they just left earth several thousand years ago i like chad's question here so we've got about three and a half minutes if you could only go to one place and try and see a ufo what would your choice be Sedona, Arizona, Mount Adams, off the coast of Monterey, California. Where would you go? Sedona is a good one, but Monterey actually is better if you're looking for for just seeing the ships, as in just a, a visual sighting of it. Now, Adams, I just I don't even know where that is. In all fairness, it's just south of us. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's part of the uh, part of the run of volcanoes right down to uh, California. Oh, okay. What about around you? What about around BC? Well, I know of like Knox is in Knox Mountain right here in Kelowna is a wonderful place right at, right here in Kelowna and just up up the ways a little bit up um, about halfway between here and Vernon. So about thirty miles. We got two spots right in the area here, within thirty miles of the city. I think they can pretty much be seen anywhere. I think these portals are everywhere. I mean, it's not, it, you know, it's just that people have caught on that it's in places like around Catalina Island. It's in Sedona, Arizona. It, you know, it's in a lot of these different areas where these craft are coming through. But I do believe that these portals or whatever we want to call them, uh, there's a lot more of them than what we know. Traveling around this world, is actually relatively easy if you can spot the spot the portals and the rocky mountains and i presume the mountains out in ontario as well have the same issue i know for a certainty that the rocky mountains have lots of portals that you can utilize to cut down on gas mileage all right johnny half is asking as we got about 90 seconds we have an earth defense force controlled by lunar operations command what do you mean by that Um, I'm not sure where that one came from, but we have an earth they like when I'm talking about the consortium, they simply want they do not they are not a earth defense force. They simply enforce the consortium guidelines. Mankind is is responsible for its own, if you will, defense platform. You know, I mean, we do have allies that come down to help or run interference, mm -hmm. but it is not it is not governed by our four orders. Okay. Let's sneak in one more. Lexi is asking, has AI completely taken over any alien races? Well, yeah. And the reason I say there is one race that is AI. You know, they are strictly mechanical. Weird. No, and that's that's the biggest issue right there. Just looking for the name of them right now, but they are strictly mechanical. All right. Keith, we're going to leave it right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection continues here on Spaced Out Radio with your questions, and we will continue on. And if I miss your question, do us a favor. Right when we're about to come back from break, just retype it in our chat room. So we're on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, and we will get right to it. Our Keith Andrews, the ET Connection, once again, continuing here on Spaced Out Radio right after this. So stay tuned.
All right, Keith, I'm just going to run to the bathroom and uh, take my dogs out. I'll be right back, okay? This is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines report. We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Space Travelers, it's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. The party is always on at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hi, this is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. <sighs> All right, I'm back. I see that. Listen, guys, I am uh, in the chat room. I am way behind on questions right now, so uh, I would appreciate if uh, you guys could uh, help me out a little bit. Uh, I've got a few of them, but 
I will try and do my best to catch up here very, very quickly. All right, that's where I started. All right, so I found the place that I started, but I'm going to be way behind here, so, uh, or where I started, where I left off. And let's see here. You can probably find the place you started, too, but that was a while yeah, back. that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Long time ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, it's hard to believe we've been at this for six years now. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we got 30 seconds. Thank you to Ed, Ashira, Cat Chaser, Greco, and Murray for those awesome, awesome super chats. I really do appreciate the love and support of Spaced Out Radio. It's a good way to to continue on here and help us do what we do on a nightly basis. If you're new, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out as we continue to grow this show. And we got more fe features here coming soon, so stay tuned. Here we go. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Thank you so much to everyone tuning on in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Technolithic. Technolithic is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our Keith Andrews, the ET Connection, continues here on the Mighty SOR. Keith joins us once a month to answer all your questions regarding extraterrestrials and UFOs. We love the woo here. So let's continue on on the woo train and let's go over to, oh, which question should we have here? Oh, let's see here. Scrolling on down. Miss Pickles, by the way, thank you so much for your super chat. When are the Fallen Ones allowed to try and get through the veil? Shadow Walkers, I have Jesus Christ on my side, so who are you representing, Keith? Well, the good news is I don't. I literally, from my standpoint, I did because of the fact I'm not the one to judge people, I simply work as an interpreter for people. I don't bother with the idea of going who's right and wrong. I've got my own outlook on what's right and wrong. But I don't work for anybody. Probably not the answer people want to hear, but, you know, can't see the point in lying about it. Really? Okay. Let's move on to our next question here from our audience. As I scroll on down, Brian is saying Chris Bledsoe and others have had experiences on Easter. I have seen UFOs on Christmas Eve in 2015. Keith, do you know if there is a religious connection to the aliens? If so, what religion? Um, the the aliens. Number one, is there a, a Terran religious connection to it? Not that I'm aware of, although they do believe in, like some of the races do believe in the same god or gods that that various Terrans do. Often they call them a different name, but it boils down to the same thing. Okay, but is there a connection as in, because they're of this religion, that's what they're what you're seeing? Not that I'm aware of. 
Greco on Twitter is asking, is humanity more likely to accept alien disclosure before or after World War III? World War III is not going to be a man-made war. So the answer would be no. Mankind, until he gets used to the idea that mankind is all one species, is going to have trouble with different shaped species coming down here. This is one of the reasons why they haven't shown up on mass. Sovereign is asking, if it's confirmed that the Dracos are demons, how can they be allies if they're demons? Well, number one, Dracos aren't demons. There are different races that are much more like the Untar would be more, more accurately referred to as a demon by human standpoints. But the Dracos themselves are a reptilian race. And understanding that demons are extremely misunderstood. Um, demon, the demons are not, a, are not an adversary to, to mankind. They're not here. They are not strictly, if you will, a counterpoint to, to mankind, or for that matter, they are not a counterpoint to the Angelus or the angels, if you will. Okay. Who are they accountable to then? The demons? Well, quite frankly, they, they are accountable to them. They do have a higher power. Okay, the demons worship somebody again that they refer to as Nantaj, which is a darker version of what you would call God. But it's the reptilian version of it, or the, well, reptilian, how do I put this? They, they are a much more volatile race than humans are. Okay, and their belief is the demons are, are pretty black and white. Their whole, their whole process of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, of promotion. Their promotion level, like for humans, do your job well and you'll get promoted. For the, for the Untars and for the demons, you want a better position in life? Kill your boss. Much like lions. Much like, yes. All right, let's move on to Gorgeous Kira, who is asking, is there a golden fractal grid surrounding Earth maintained by higher ETs? Um, okay, is there a golden fractal grid around Earth? The answer is yes. It is not maintained by ETs. It is generated by man. I mentioned a long time ago that mankind is one of the few races, well, quite frankly, that I'm aware of, it's the only race that has the capacity to actively, to consciously affect what humans call zero-point uh, zero energy. Okay, that, that yellow grid that she's talking about is, is the, the physical manifestation of said energy. The mankind tends to tap into, but it is not governed or controlled, much less understood by the off-worlders. All right. Belenium is asking, do aliens experience paranormal haunting similar to humans? Yes. Okay. See, the funny thing is the ghost world is not just a Terran phenomenon. Every race has their fair share of them. Some of them have more than their fair share, but... But yeah, hauntings, paranormal activity, understanding paranormal is anything outside of your normal repertoire. The ironic part of it is that there are races that until recently thought humans were a myth. All right, let's move on to another one. Blue Line is asking, do any aliens have to wear glasses like humans do? Try that again. Do any aliens have to wear glasses like humans do? Um, 
No, not that. I mean, some of them do like some of them will, but they they prefer healing the eyes as as compared to putting an optical uh, optical cover on them. Unless you're talking about the enhanced glasses, i.e., for distance vision, and I mean very long distance, more like what you'd call telescope. But corrective lenses, they do one of two things. Usually they either repair the, the eyeball altogether or they kill the person with the weak eyes. All right, Greg is asking, if I get abducted by the Awara, then the pilots all pass out from food poisoning. Do you think I could figure out how to fly us back to safety? Theoretically, the answer is yes, but I can see there being one massive problem. I'm laying odds he does not have arms that are six feet long each. That's a big steering <laughs> wheel, man. That's a big <laughs> steering wheel. <laughs> I was just imagining that. Holy cow. All right. Let's move on. Lexi is asking, are there any squid-like alien races? Yeah. Quite frankly, I caught that question. That would be the quiz bar. And they literally look like squid. Um, they have eight arms, and the two legs are have the wide the wide paddle feet, if you will. Right. I will add to that because that reminds me of the aliens on the first Independence Day that were in the tubes that looked very squid like. And believe it or not, there are some people in the UFO world who have talked about that creature being very, very real. I forgot about that. When I watched the original Independence Day, the first, I mean, I had a really bad reaction to it, but my first comment was the was that Area 51 was bang on. And although the although the crit the critters they had in the tubes were absolutely accurate, right, but that would be the quiz bar. They were not the ones that that Area 51 has. But those, and thank you very much for reminding me of that, because the Odina are in Arrival. It's the Queens Bar that are in in 94. All right, moving on. Cat wants to know, are ancient Egyptian gods aliens like Bastet or Ra? Yes. Much like the ancient Norse gods. Of course, the Norse gods got their fingers slapped. See, the, the difference there was the the Egyptians, they they vacated the you know, Bast and Ra vacated before the before the consortium actually got here. The Norse gods were here when the consortium arrived. And the consortium went, uh yeah, you may be more advanced than them, but that does not give you the right to claim godhood. So get out. <laughs> Which is why the Norse gods just vanished. All right, let's move on. Sovereign is asking, which alien races are harvesting adrenochrome? Well, number one, the Teclac are, well, they're harvesting a lot. But I'd be inclined to say it's probably the Teclac. It could be the Tormenon, because the Tormenon are known to do whatever they're told, whatever they're paid for. And of course, there are some grave that will do it quite readily. You know, like I mentioned a while ago, the majority of gray are just scientists. There's no negative to them. There's just, that's what they do. They tag, they research, they explore. Then you have some that are decent, and then you've got the black market, you know, the black market people. All right. Let's go on here. Fast Emmy is asking, what is the government then doing with adrenochrome? Now that, I don't know. Of course, it's not like I have a real connect, a real, you know, contact run with the, with the governments on this planet. I know they know where I am, but considering the fact I, I flat out tell people, overthrowing local governments is a bad idea. Government is necessary to run a society. Of 
Let's move on here. Overbuilt would like to know, Keith, would you date a cat humanoid lady? What are they like as a people? Well, if I think my girlfriend would probably complain a lot if I tried that. But I don't see a problem with it, per se. Um, the Lemurians are, are very honorable. Little definite temperamental. You know, but do I have anything against them? No. Am I personally drawn to them? No. Uh, Greco wants to know if you can give a little bit more intel on this non-human World War III. Well, there's three of them. Okay. The the Taklek have a civil war going on because their their leader is wanted to wanted to completely strip Earth of its entire of its entire mineralogical components, as well as the entire population. And a great number of their, of their citizenry did not agree with it. So they started fighting against the idea. Then you've got the war between the Teklek and the, and the Srizazians, which the Srizazians have a very big beef with the, with the Teklek. That's been going on for eons. And of course, the Teklek seem to be in the middle of a lot of things because they the reason they came here was because they are dealing with another race that is heading for their world. We get them once in a while here. Like we get once in a while, you run into one. It's a xenon, which somebody asked earlier if there were any robotic or AI races. Okay, but the xenon, their their primary drive, they go in, strip a planet right to the core complete with the breaking down of mineralogical components, which leaves nothing but powder out of the planet, and then move on. All right. But, you know, the biggest issue is that the consortium itself runs a barricade around, around Earth to stop anybody, to stop the wayward, you know, war from getting down to buy, to damage this planet. Oh, wow. My buddy Mark just messaged me. Says, so I was standing by our fridge moments ago, and a dark shadow ball about waist high, about three inches in diameter, zoomed away from me. I saw it plain as day. That's weird. Been a while since I've seen anything. Very interesting. Very interesting. Very. Yeah. I love it when that stuff happens. Let's go to Lexi here. Are there currently any alien species holding political office? Not that I'm aware of, at least. And I shouldn't put it that way. I should put it on Earth. No. Okay, they undoubtedly hold office in their own worlds. But it is absolutely forbidden for them to get into the political arena here. Now, some may, but that I'm aware of, absolutely. As in what she seems to be referring to, is a like somebody holding a high position and the answer to that is it's actually forbidden on their end because doing so would interrupt the natural evolution of mankind makes sense makes sense all right marty is asking is the galactic council concerned about earth's magnetic pole shift not in the slightest it's a normal thing From their standpoint, it's kind of like being worried about the sunrise. Okay. No more than that? Well, I mean, the magnetic pole shift is a normal thing that happens every, from what I gather, about every 360,000 years. So it's a little behind schedule right now, but not abnormally so. So I mean, from their from their standpoint, it literally is kind of like watching a, a sunrise. It just doesn't have a lot of impact for them. Mankind gets worried because they don't understand it yet. Yeah, you know, I mean, if you think of it this way, it's kind of like the planet is rolling over. Right. Okay, let's go over to Sovereign's question. 
I've been hearing that Sasquatch is part reptilian. Does that account for their shape shifting? Could it? The, could the Sasquatch actually be part of the Anunnaki? Um, technically, given the word "could," technically the answer is it could be, but but the the Sasquatch is not reptilian, nor is it Anunnaki. You know, they, they are a race unto themselves. Rye is asking, can aliens get diseases like COVID? Well, like COVID, yes. They, they have their own illnesses and what have you they have to deal with. But are they susceptible to Terran, to Terran diseases? Quite frankly, not from anything I've gathered. Yeah, you know, and that being said, they also don't because of their of their own medical expertise. When they come down here, they don't worry about about bringing the uh, bringing the illness with them, you know, and subjecting mankind to it. Right, makes sense. Makes sense. Let's get to Greco's question: Are all ghosts, humans, and aliens existing on the same plane? Um, the answer is yes. See, the ghost in the ghost plane or the the etheric plane is another vibratory rate that spirit goes to. And the thing is that aliens, humans, trees, bears doesn't matter. They all have the same spiritual pattern and all end up in the same place. Which basically is where the where the issue is. All right. Will wants to know if you could clarify about whether or not reptilians are evil. You kind of touched on that a little bit before, but can you touch on it again if you don't mind? I don't mind at all. Definitively not. The whole concept that reptilians as a race are evil, as near as I can figure, it comes out of the out of the late seventies, early eighties movie movie and series called V. Reptilians are depending on the race. Now, there's a dozen different reptilian races I know of. Okay, none of them are inherently evil, though some of them humans would definitely see as evil. You know, I mean, the tech like, for instance, which has a penchant for liking human flesh. You might consider them evil. They themselves, though, are not what you would call what I call evil. You know, they do the because the tech like don't torture people. They don't hurt people just to hurt them. I mean, they have a purpose for hurting people. Like if they're going to kill you, know, if they're going to eat them, they do tend to kill them first. Okay, quickly, one more question as we got about a minute to go here. Another one from Greco. Can human and alien gods go to war with one another? What would that mean to humanity? Um, well, I'm presuming he means the, the, the gods that, that humans worship. Could they go to war with each other? The answer is yes. And if the consortium were to step out of the picture, it would mean that this planet could get decimated in the middle of it. Now, if you take a look at what they consider gods and what you consider actual gods, and I don't mean the I don't mean the Nordics, okay, but I mean what came before the well, what came before this universe. If he got into a war, the rest of them would just cease to exist. Like it, it literally would be that quick of a battle. So mankind. Worrying about a war between the aliens or between the alien gods is a little overrated in my eyes because it's literally one of those things you won't know about it until you're already dead. All right. Let's see where we got here. Greco wants to know why are aliens fascinated with cheese? <laughs> I think he has a rat problem. Maybe I a think mouse so. problem. And uh, John wants to know, do aliens have beards? We got 10 seconds. <laughs> Some of them, yes. Especially if you take a look at, at the Dwarvish race. Now, there's a crew that have beards. 
Awesome. We'll leave it right there. Our Keith Andrews and the AT Connection Hello, continues on Space Talk Radio man. right after this. Oh, I accidentally butchered that. Look at Wait. that. Oh, my timeline here. Damn it. Okay. It happens on occasion. I know. Um, I need to write this down so I can fix it after the show. All right, scrolling through. I'm just trying to get caught up here. Thanks, Dr. Marty, for that awesome super chat. Really do appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for uh, you uh, doing that. Uh, Sig Sauer, Eric uh, Files, Miss Pickles, Ed Clayner, Ashira, Cat Chaser, Greco, and Murray. Thank you so much for the love uh, on everything you guys do here. I really do appreciate that, man. So much, so, so much. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you to our new subscribers that are popping on in. We're growing by about 5 to 10 a day right now. 5 to 10 a day. That's kind of cool to watch those numbers go up. Uh, but thank you so much for doing that. And uh, now I'm going to check my 11 o'clock. There's a hour. Stepping. Probably. Oh, that one looks good. All right, I think I see what I did wrong here. Check that. <clears throat> we love you, Eric Files. We love you, man. Dave does not need a mohawk. Dave does not need a mohawk. No, somehow I don't think it would work well on you. I took like a three-hour nap today in the afternoon. I never take a nap that long. I usually call that sleep. Yeah, it was, uh, honestly, it felt great. Really that's, did. Yeah. See, that's about the length of time I usually sleep. It's about three hours. Then I'll be up for three or four, and then I'll go back to sleep for an hour. Uh -huh. All right. Oh, the gorgeous Jessica McCreary is here, and uh, she is asking uh, in non-capital letters, has our Keith ever given me insight to my abductions? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. We can talk about that. I'll ask that one on the show. All right. Oh, well, it'll be a fun, fun ride tomorrow, Keith. My what are you up to? Oh, yeah, you said you're heading off, off, yep. uh, off the reservation, as it were. Hi, Polar Eclipse. How you doing? Welcome to the show. Welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, just a reminder, guys, put your questions in capital letters. It makes it a, a lot. Uh, by the way, Steam Train Mark in Australia has confirmed, Keith, we are alive tomorrow. Oh, good. And in the future. 
Good, that's I'm glad to hear that. Very, good. very important. Well, it is. Very, know, very important. Far easier to interact with people when you're still breathing. Right? Yeah, so that's good. I'll have a good ride tomorrow because I know I will be alive. Now, you know you'll be alive tomorrow, but at this point, you're not certain you'll be alive the day after, so you still got to be careful. All right. <laughs> uh, all right, Keith, let's uh, get going here. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for tuning us in. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. Keith, you ready for some questions? Absolutely. All right, let's do this thing, man. Sovereign is asking, where are the Lemurians currently located and stationed? I know which mountain they're at, but does our Keith Andrews know which mountain? I think he's trying to challenge you here, Keith. He probably is. And the nice part there is he can go ahead and try. The reality is, as I keep telling people, I'm not revealing the location of where these people are for a number of reasons. Mankind has enough troubles. They don't need to start that kind of poking around. So in other words, Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta is where they are. Because everything's at Mount Shasta. That's my answer for everything. I always I always think of Shasta as as uh, you know as a home of root beer, but you know. I know you do. Mount Shasta. That's what I'm sticking with. Okay. All right. Greg wants to know what Carl's laugh sounds like. Um, I think the easiest way to put it is you can either compare it to a magpie or if you've got an amplifier, it sounds very much like a cricket. Like, it's the funniest thing to hear, but a little hard to compare it to anything, at least anything humanly audible. This is true. This is true. We've tested it in my backyard. Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. That that was a call that was just, that's one of those calls that you never forget. I, I will never forget that, man, listening to them have a conversation in my yard. That was so strange. So, so strange. Now there's going to be people all over North America like, really, this dude on the radio is just admitting that he's got aliens in his yard? Yeah. Yeah, I went there. Even my stalker out there, he's going to be like, Oh, there he goes, talking about the aliens that he has no proof of. Oh, well. Millennium is asking, do the off-worlders like the song Come Sail Away by Styx or any other artist singing about their E.T. contact? Um, that's a very individualistic question, and the answer is some of them do, some of them don't. It's kind of like some humans do and some humans don't. You know, in the content, it's when you're talking music, it's very much a personalized taste. Like, but do they have any problem with with the with the songs about ET? The answer is not in the slightest, because they came to the conclusion that many people will listen to a song like that and take it as just a song. They don't look at the at the reality behind a lot of them. Makes sense. Let's move on. Blue Line wants to know, can Sasquatch disappear? Only technically. They don't actually disappear and they don't actually teleport anywhere. But they are master camouflage, masters of camouflage. 
Nikki wants to know, what do you remember of Atlantis? Were you where were you an extraterrestrial at that time? Only if you consider an Atlantean an extraterrestrial. Um, which they were. Um <laughs> Where was I? I was actually up in the tower when the thing took off. I was literally a rocket scientist at that point, working on the on the jet propulsion system. And as far as what it was like, it was phenomenal. The artwork and the artistry, the artistry of the cut lines on in that city were phenomenal. Yeah, and I have yet to see anything that even remotely rivals it in today's world. Except in some of the movies I've seen, they've done a good a good rendition of of some of the artwork in it. But I mean, there were you know the the reality was what we call skyscrapers here were mild by comparison. Especially at that time, in, in especially when you compare them to the to the um, the structures that mankind was working with when when Atlantis arrived. All right, let's move on here. Greco wants to know, according to the aliens, what three things are or put these three things in order of levels of importance: humans, cows, or gold. Humans would be first on the overall run of it. Gold is almost irrelevant at this point, and cattle are they're, they're only specifically useful for certain people, like for certain groups. But humans are a cat they are a, a um, consortium wide concern, both on the positive and the negative, if you will. Blue Line wants to know, do aliens know and show what love is? Absolutely. Not always the same way that mankind does. But, of course, in in certain races, okay, like the Wara, for instance, when you when you start beating on your on your wife on 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 a female counterpart, that's actually showing them you care because what it shows them is you respect them. You respect their strength. You respect their prowess. You sound, okay. You sounded like the Iron Sheik there. <laughs> Just well, as far as I'm aware, I'm not related to him. But no, I mean, do they show love? Absolutely. The Venusians and the Orions are much are much more adept at it in the way that humans are aware of. And Mobians are almost identical in their exp in their expression of it. All right, moving on. Um, Sovereign wants to know if you've ever heard of a Queventelier race. Q U E V E N T E L L I U R. You want to respell that for me, there, Dave? That would be Q U E V E N T E L L I U R. Doesn't sound like you've heard of them. No, but on the other hand, once I you know, I would love to love to know a little bit more about them because I may know them by a different name, which is something that I found out with a lot of the races I know. They are and people have run into them. But especially in the scientific community, they're more they're more often than not number designants. But I would love to know more about more about the traits that they that these people that the Quaventilier um, exude that this that this individual knows. You know, if he can drop me a line and, and give me a rundown, I may know them by a different name. All right. Moving on, uh, Rye Guy is asking, do aliens listen to the radio during space flight? If so, what kind of tunes? And again, we're back to the music thingy. There are some that absolutely play them and play tunes. You know, when when they're dealing with it. And it's usually the younger generations that do it. It's not very often the older ones. 
the older, more seasoned tend to be a little bit more, if you will, stuck in the mud. All right. Moving on. Jessica wants to know, it's not too personal. Have you ever worked with me about my abductions? That is an excellent question. And there are two factors involved there. Number one, I honestly don't know. That'd be the first problem. Number two, even if I had, there is no, even if I knew for certain one way or the other, there is no way I would be 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 dropping that on the table. I would confirm it if they, if the individual were to say, I worked with Keith, then I would absolutely confirm it if I recalled it. But without that, like I wouldn't just drop anybody into the, into the meat grinder on that one. Oh, you can drop me into the meat grinder. I got a few pounds to lose. <laughs> Just focus on dropping the pounds. Don't lose it. Problem with losing weight is, is anything lost usually comes back. And with weight specifically, it seems to come back with company. Yeah, 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 I know. Shush. <laughs> you know? Shush. As I drink water here. All right. Yeah, you can share any stories you want about what, what I've gone through. Because I've talked to you about most of them. Most of them. I still think the best one we ever had was when Carl showed up in the backyard. That was just absolutely freaking priceless. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Joe still bugs me about that, that I went to Tim Hortons and grabbed a donut and a, an ice cap before heading off to the lake to see if I could see the mothership, which I never saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was weird. Will wants to know... Do you think aliens can be contacted through a Ouija board? Some of the answer would be yes, by definition. Bear in mind, the Ouija board is a it's a, essentially a telephone to the other side of the veil. Hello. And, and there are some aliens that do dwell over there. Of course, if you don't know how to handle a Ouija board properly, don't go playing around with it. It can create all kinds of havoc. Bad stuff. Bad stuff. Dirt Want Road wants to know, are fairies aliens? No, they're ancient race. The fairy folk evolved on Earth. All right. Moving on. IHAS wants to know, do you have any tips on CE5 or attracting UFOs in general? Number one, CE5. Um, oh, that's, that's human initiated isn't it yes i'm still trying to figure out how people do that i mean i started off doing it by their by their go ahead um the one thing i can tell you though is that number one be clear if you're putting any effort into it be clear that you want that you desire a a connection you desire an experience that you consider amicable not that they do, that you do. Because I'll tell you, if you just do what I've heard some people go and go, I just want to, I just want to be abducted. I don't care by who. This is just asking for a problem. <coughs> but I do know that optics work well, and so do sonics. For if you're if you're using a a cyclic, um, a cyclic sonic, sonic generator. You're likely to get a. You're more likely to get a response than just standing there and talking about it. Sonic or optical, but for an optical one, like people that tell me, use the laser and just use a pen laser and you can get their attention. Um, that's kind of like holding a candle up in front of the sun and going, you can see the candle. You know, if you're going to use the laser, you've got to use a pretty powerful one. All right, let's move on to a new question here. And Blue Line wants to know, what's your definition of time travel? Forward is, well, time travel, the definition is simple, travel through time. But traveling forward in time is absolutely possible. 
problem is time traveling backwards in time isn't. Oh, okay, you can go forward, you can look backwards, you know, much like looking at a video, but you can't change the thing, and you can't communicate with the actors from the past. Right. You can jump forward, but of course, what that does is jump forward in time because you can't jump back. Your existence just sim simply ceases to be recorded until such time as you arrive. Dr. Michael P. Masters, who is our guest on the show the other night, he's saying that he believes that aliens from the future are actually us coming back to help grab potentially DNA to keep the species going. He just doesn't know when they're or they're when they're from, I guess, is the proper English on that. That would be the proper English, yes. And the re and from my standpoint, we would definitely not see eye to eye on that one because I don't know what I've what I've been shown for a lot of reasons is you cannot come back in time. Taking that whole that whole thesis right out the window. Now, if it can be proven to me that you can come back in time, that'd be great. But from everything I've done, everything I've looked at, and everything I've witnessed, the answer is no. All right, moving on. Uh, Bomber wants to know: Do aliens keep pets around? Like, do they have cats? Um. Well, yeah, but depending on the race, they like they've got. And they've got animals that they consider feline, you know, feline or canine. I mean, it's funny. If you take a look at the Maldocs, they've got some real nasty little animals, you know, that they call pets. The Teclec, of course, have their own version, right? The Chitawari, or not the Chitawari, rather, but the Chupacabra used to belong to the Teclec. You know, so are there pets out there? Absolutely. All right. Sovereign wants to know which races are cloning humans, lab-growing humans just from DNA from a hair. That would be called humans. See, the off-worlders don't bother cloning humans. Okay, so the only people trying to clone humans are humans. You know, it's not like they're trying to build a clone war, set up clone wars out there. Why not? Well, because humans are literally rational and unpredictable. If you're cloning them, what you're doing is getting that kind of a of a you know package of dynamite or package of nitroglycerin in a, in a bar shaker. It's just not a good idea. True. True. All right, moving on. T Rev, welcome to our chat room. Wants to know. Do all alien races come from one creator or have beliefs in a creator? Okay, do all of them now in the when you when you break it down to the ultimate level, the answer is yes, they do all come from one. Most of them from a racial standpoint absolutely believe in a higher being. There are multiple different names for them. Okay. But there are those that are disbelievers in other in other races as well. They go, no, we are we're just strictly we evolved that on our own, and that's all there is. When we die, we end up in a in a box, and that's it. You know, so do they believe in a in a higher being? Yes. Some refer to it as God. Many refer to it as source or the universe. And of course, the much older races tend to refer to it as the prime originator. All right, let's move on. Football Cat Dave, have you taken a toy plane to the crash site yet? No, I have not. Can't get there. We're going to try and get there on the weekend. Uh, too much snow still in the mountains here. Too much snow. All right, Sovereign is asking, which race brought the devil's lettuce to earth, as in marijuana? Oh, Play meets off for that one. As in, she grew it here herself. It didn't originate off planet. Blue Line is asking, where do Bigfoot prints 
go in the winter when there's snow? Um, my guess is they melt. Wait, I have no idea. Uh, hey, oh, whoa, 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 Keith. That is way too logical an answer to be riding on the Wu train with. Come on. Way too well, logical of an answer. If you're asking if they just up and vanish, the reality is Bigfoot on the whole will walk on the surface of the snow. They do once in a while hit a soft patch, but they also know how to cover their tracks in a very natural fashion. Like, so, so it looks like a natural drop. Chris Mo wants to know, do you know anything about the microscopic alien repairing the fabric of space-time? Well, going back to the time problem, um, there are absolutely very tiny little little uh, races that do that do repair da repair spatial damage and wormhole maintenance. Um, oh, the archons. I was trying to think of the name offhand. The Archons are a race that does know how to. They, generally speaking, when they're trying to evolve, they actually use corporeal hosts. But they are a they are a tiny little thing to start with. But as they mature, when they get out into outer space, that's when they take over maintenance of the different of the different, if you will, roadways. But you don't repair time. You know, time itself was built un unto itself and it was put in place way before mankind ever came along. Heck, it came into existence way before the universe came along. All right, let's move on. Rai is wondering, is Agartha a real place or just a fairy tale? Honestly, I haven't heard the term before, but I'm wondering if it's another name for Eden. I have no idea. Okay. Well, if he wants to clarify that part, um, I haven't heard the name before, and of course, I'm a, I am very, very poorly read. I has is wondering, what can one with no experiences at all do to get to having experiences? Well, the first thing I'd be wondering is whether or not, and this isn't a question of whether or not she believes it, but I'd be questioning whether or not she's had them before and doesn't know it and just doesn't recall it. Now, that being said, one of the ways you can go about that is find a qualified hypnotherapist that knows how to do the job properly. You know, one that doesn't plant seeds. I've seen some that it's absolutely horrendous what they do. But find one that is known for not planting seeds to get them to take a get them to help you take a look in your in your mind because the odds are the fact that you've got an interest in having a, in having an abduction and in having one that you recall does provide a rather strong indicator that you've already been taken and just don't know it or more to the point don't recall it. Let's sneak one more in here. Sneak one more in. Sovereign wants to know, are all alien races pagan? Absolutely not. See, pagan is simply another catch-all for non-traditional. Okay. Now, the, the reality is they don't worship, worship God the way that humans do. Or God by any name, any name, the way you. All right, Keith, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection hanging out tonight all night long. Hour three of Alien Talk coming up next on the Mighty SOR. There's a lot of questions from our audience. We'll see if we get to the news. I'll let Keith make that decision when we come back. Space Out Radio continues after this.
All right, Keith. Uh, I'm going to run the pa- uh, the dogs out, so I'll be right back, okay? Okay, dog. The Moose Vancouver is where you want to be when visiting Canada's west coast. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose cranks up the rock while serving some of the best-rated food in the city. The menu starts at $6.95. Why party anywhere else in Vancouver when the Moose is right there? Get your horns up and rock with the Moose, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. We all know on Spaced Out Radio, we love a good beard and mustache. So why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the story you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. All right, let's uh, get you back here, Keith. Okie doke. Do you want to go the full hour or do you want to uh, cut it off at the half? You're looking tired, but I'm fine. Well, I got to be here no matter what. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying there's a lot of audience questions here tonight. A yeah. Lot, a lot of them. But see how uh, we are once we get to the bottom of the hour. How about that? Absolutely. All right.
Sorry for yawning in the YouTube video, making all of you all of a sudden yawn. My bad. Blame me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's just wrong. I know. No, I was just looking at one of the comments in the in the chat room. Which one? Uh, it's uh, from Bomber. Uh, I can't see it. Right, it's right near the bottom here. Uh, if I add maple syrup, this will be the soup. <laughs> I can't see it. It's just wrong. Uh, she's a weirdo, and that's why we love her. She's a weirdo. That's why we love her. All right. Ozzy Rob has sent over a picture of his ham hocks. Thank you so much, Ozzy Rob. Really do appreciate that. How's tomorrow looking? Please let us know. Uh, thank you to Murray, Greco, Cat Chaser, Ashira, Ed, Miss Pickles, Eric, Sig, and Marty for the awesome super chats tonight. Here we go. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. I really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, Technolithic. Technolithic is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on with our Keith Andrews of the ET Connection. A fun night of woo as we gather on the woo train to answer all your weird, strange questions regarding extraterrestrials. Keith, we're going to continue on here. Sovereign has a question. People that speak in tongues, are they possessed by a demonic type alien? Highly improbable. Quite often they are they are connected to somebody, but it is you know, it is very unlikely that they are demonic per se. Okay, number one, there aren't really that many uh, that many of the demons that actually connect through people to get them to say anything. But um, by definition, are they possessed? Hijack would be a better way of putting it. Because all and all they're really doing is hijacking the vocal tur or the the vocal cords. All right, let's move on. Another question from Sovereign: Do people get abducted while driving their car? Oh yeah, it happens. Oh, I've been taken that way. I was actually well. The thing is, I was taken that way with a with a a, a um, passenger. But the nice part about it is they don't just yank you out of the car. They do control the car to make sure it comes to a, a nice, comfortable stop. So they can put you back in it and leave you alone. Or at least let you get back on the road. All right, continuing on, another one from Sovereign. Do aliens pause time, do something to you, then place you right back on your timeline, and you'd think nothing happened? Uh, no. What they do is they they stop you and they pause your brain so you don't register it. Okay, this is why people end up with what they call missing time, because people realize they, that there's time missing, but they don't know where it went. And all it is is there is a brain has been, their cognitive brain has been shut off. Okay. Greco is wondering, based on some info you have provided, Keith, the best way to communicate with aliens at this point is through the paranormal round. Is this so? 
Well, the best way, quite frankly, is actually technological. The only problem is most people haven't got a clue how to build one. You got to remember, most off-worlders are technological based. Okay, so I mean, if you can figure out how to build something that runs on it, that runs with enough power that they can pick it up, that would certainly be your better option. But you know, is it easier to connect with them from a paranormal a paranormal standpoint than by using a local telephone? Absolutely. You know, unlike E.T., you can't just call home. Well, actually, he did, but he built a really big transceiver. All right. Why do UFOs siphon water from lakes? It's called fuel. You know, I mean, the, the reality is, Water has an extremely high component of hydrogen, which is a great fuel system. And besides that, the reason they use lakes is because the water, the seawater, is too salty. They got to do too much in the way of, of cleaning it first. Otherwise, you get staggering deposits on the walls. All right, let's move on. Sovereign's asking, per what you said in a previous show about no mind control from aliens, then why are there tons of cases where people are in a trance-like state? Wouldn't that be considered mind control? Um, the If I recall the, the reference correctly, it was a question of making of aliens taking control of humans and telling humans to go and do certain things. Do they interrupt their, their cranial thoughts? The answer is definitively yes. And I guess by by definition, you could call that mind control, but it's not um, it's not the same connotation or the same purpose. It's one of the drawbacks with the spoken word. It's also one of the reasons why a lot of them develop telepathy. How about demonic possession where the demonic alien is control in control of a body vessel. Wouldn't that be that mind does, control? No, that's kind of, well, technically, again, technically the answer is yes, but the number of cases of that are extremely limited. But if you're going to take over somebody's body, by definition, you have to take the mind to do it. Okay, let's move on. Wendy is asking, do aliens like human music? If so, which kinds? That's that funny thing about a very individual issue. Some aliens love human music. Okay, and one of the most common forms is the drum circles or or the old, you know, the old percussion instruments. Okay, and the reason for it is because of the sonic impact. Sonic impact, what do you mean by that? Well, when you're using a drum, okay, the impact of the stick on the drum creates a sonic shockwave. Okay, a much more, a much more cl clear impact. Okay, that, that, they, that they can subsequently feel, especially when you start looking at the insect-based ones, at the insect-based races. Define insect-based races. They look like Terran insects. For instance, your the mantis ray, the mantis, the ta the talon. Both of those are are essentially, by human definition, they're insectoid. The vegans are another one that look like insects, or at least look like they're descended from insects. Is more to the point. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Let us, uh, I got to scroll way up here, man. All right. 
by the way, Rye says, Agartha is inner earth written in ancient books and is something like Eden. Okay. Then the answer is, yeah. Been there, done that. It's a great place to hang around. A lot of different races there. Joshua is asking, for the, the love of God, can someone please clarify where Keith gets his information for context? Keith, we get this question every time you're on. Pretty much. It's called first-hand experience. I don't research. I go through it. It's just that simple. And yes, that makes my life very much like science fiction. You know, I used to question it myself all the time, but I've had so many people corroborate what I've gone through that I've just given up questioning whether I've gone through it. But my entire repertoire comes from first hand. I haven't, I don't think I've researched anything aside from asking questions like I did today, like, where, what the heck is a Gartha? <laughs> you know? Well, sometimes you're not going to know anything. It's okay. It's okay. All right. Sovereign wants to know Have you been told the password to Shambhala? Which is another name for the same place, by the way. Um, the funny part there is everybody can get to it. It's not so much a password as a thought process. And that's why it takes people as long as it does to figure it out. But it's not like a it's not like a hidden vault that you have to, you know, say the magic word and it all of a sudden opens up for you. Blue Line is wondering, why are some portals evil and some are kind? Portals are neither. They just, some lead to bad places, that, places that humans consider bad. But the portals themselves, that's kind of like asking why are some roads good and some roads bad. You know, they are, portals are simply access points. You know, they are simply a way of getting from one point to another. Can we as humans create or manifest portals? Absolutely. How do we do that? Um, well, there's a dangerous idea. Sure, but why not? Let's have some fun. Ultimately, it boils down to concentrating on it with the right vibratory thought process in mind and accept the fact that you, number one, have the capacity to do it and then stay very focused on it. But be aware, if you do that, it's like any other tool. If you do it and you're trying to learn by doing, you can put yourself in places you don't want to be and won't survive. Because let's remember, a portal opens to two places, where you are and where you're going. And if you're trying to, to create a portal, there's two things you have to consider. Start off, number one, with very localized. So like, let's say for instance, build a portal to the other side of your yard. But you have to take into consideration the ro the speed of rotation of the Earth and the speed the Earth is moving through the, through the galaxy. Okay. In order to get the landing point right, because if you get it wrong, you end up in outer space and nobody knows about it. You just vanish. Well, you show up, but, I mean, it won't last long. Joe in California wants to know, do people get abducted from large airliners in flight? Yes. Which, uh, you know, I, I know that was a real short answer, but the reality is if you exist anywhere on the planet, somebody can grab you if they really want to. It's not that hard to calculate out the, the, um, the pickup point if you're going to yank somebody out of an airline. Okay, because you got to remember, these guys are used to yanking things out of vehicles that are traveling at sublight speed. And in some cases, at light speed. So at a couple of, at a couple of hundred miles an hour is just child's play. 
All right. John wants to know, do UFOs and aliens convert into heavy water? You know, that's actually kind of an interesting question. I, and I, I think he, I know where he's going with this, where he's asking, you know, a lot of UFOs, we think, we don't know, we think, could be positive, could be negative, that they can disguise themselves as clouds. Ah, uh, I need atmospheric ionization. Not technically disguising themselves. What they do is they is they pull the the one the clouds around them, and they do it to conceal themselves. It boils down to to ionizing the hull to draw extreme condensation around it in in a in a bubble form. Okay. Why would they do that? Is that just for camouflage? That is so the mankind doesn't go, oh my gosh, there's a great big ship there. That it is literally to hide themselves from larger populations. Rai wants to know, what's the secret behind the numbers 3, 6, and 9? Well, number one, three is the number of creativity. Six is, is community. And nine is discrimination. Meaning, between the three of them, okay, you're looking at three, six, nine, which is 18, which is seven. Three, six, and nine combined will give you a very solid understanding of yourself once you start to understand it. But the importance of three itself is that is the number of creation. Okay, not number one. Interesting. So do you put much stock into numerology then? I do, just not in base 10. See, base 10 numerology has a massive flaw in it. Okay. The reason humans use base 10 numerology is simply put, they ran out of fingers. Okay, but if you look at the at the basic numerology, okay, they have number they have the letter A, A, J, and T all as number one. Well, the reality is there is only one first letter in the alphabet. Okay, with base 12 numerology, which is what I work with. The only letter that has a value of one is the A. The only number that has a value of one is one. And yes, that's a whole long discussion. <laughs> you know, but yes, everything does vibrate at a very specific rate. And that is one of the one of the discrepancies when we get people talking about, about different dimensions. It's not that these guys are stepping into a different dimension. It's they're altering their vibratory rate, so they become invisible in this one. Blue Line wants to know, why do some entities enjoy certain portals? Well, depends on which portals, but number one, it's usually a question of where the portal is going and whether it's a convenient run to get where they're aiming for. Of course, in some cases, some of the portals are a riot, kind of like a roller coaster, and that would explain their their interest in it with some of the, with some of the younger entities. Vinny wants to know, Keith, do you know about airplanes that are stopped in midair for some reason? Well, I know how they do it. If that's what you mean. What's going on oh. there? Well, all they're doing is using a, a they'll, they'll, number one, they put a technological field around that creates a geosynchronous orbit, locks the ship in place without letting it drop. And then they've got the chance to examine the plane and or take somebody off it. But ultimately, that's what they're doing. They're creating a, they're creating a magnetic field to hold the ship, hold the plane in geosynchronous orbit, so it doesn't get lost on, uh, on its trip to wherever it's heading. 
Sovereign wants to know that you said that it takes around 12 resets for humans to learn to live in balance. Who is managing these resets? The individual. On a soul level? Yes. This was something that was set up way before mankind was even a remote thought. And it applies to every corporeal entity out there. And for that matter, every non-corporeal one. Okay, understanding, of course, that I'm using the term corporeal because it's one that humans can understand. But in truth, all entities are corporeal. They're just different densities. Okay. Let's move on. Aaron wants to know, do any race or species have or use time travel? There are many races that have used time travel going forward. None of them use it going backwards. None of them even send their consciousness back in time to affect the past. But many have been known to use them as individuals. Entire races don't use them because, well, frankly, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. All right. Let's uh, see where we're going here. I has is asking, are Ascended Masters a real thing? Do people with enough spiritual development actually turn into demigods like these Masters? Um, are Ascended Masters a real thing? They are in as much as people call them that. When people, uh, when people get properly spiritually attuned, can they do things that make them look like demigods? Yes. But the bottom line is this. Every single entity is a demigod. They just don't know it, and therefore don't exude the the um, don't exude the abilities. Every every corporeal entity has the capacity to perform this sort of thing. But the more the more evolved you get, the more power you, the more of your old abilities you draw to you and, and gain act and regain access to. Hmm. All right. Well, we only have about 90 seconds here, Keith. Questions are slowing down. So we're probably going to say good night to you after this half hour and, and get to the news, but uh, do us a favor, tell everybody, where they can find your information, your YouTube channel, your books. The easiest way to find all of the above is my YouTube channel. YouTube channel is Inner Voice Enterprises. And on every one of the videos, you'll find a whole pile of contact points for me, as well as the information on the books at the same time. Very cool, man. Very cool. I think it's always great when we have you on, my friend. I mean, you are just so knowledgeable, and that's why I love doing this show once a month with you. It it has been a real joyride. I mean, we've had some hiccups on the way, but let's face it. I mean, six years is a long time. Yeah, but it's a fun time, isn't it? It has been. It has been a great time, and, and we really appreciate you every time you come on and... Uh, and uh, join us. So you continue on. You're doing what you're doing. And and uh, we will have a good conversation with you next month when we will take more audience questions from you. Because I know you enjoy answering them as well. Oh, yeah. I, quite frankly, if it weren't for the audience, I frankly couldn't do this job that well. And this is really a job, but it really is a question of the audience is what makes this thing work. It really is, isn't it? Yeah, we have a lot of fun with them. We really do. Our Keith Andrews and the ET Connection. We'll talk to Keith near the beginning of next month. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire that Captain Shirks put together for us. And we have the thought of the day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this.
the questions dried up, man. So I figured, you know what? We'll let you go get some rest and relaxation. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. No problem, man. There's no point in beating it to death, as it were. No, no. There's some good funny news in here tonight, too. Strange oh, news. Good. Yeah. People need, if people need something to laugh about. Yeah, they do. You know, especially Sovereign Farts. He just, uh, he needs a reason to rip. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Well, buddy, we'll talk to you soon, okay? Absolutely. You have a good one. And thanks right. again, eh? Take care, buddy. You too. Bye. Our Keith Andrews, everyone. A nice shot of ham hock there, Ozzy Rob. Good ham hock. Good solid ham hock. Yeah, let's see here. Oh, God, I'm going to add this one. That's a nice Florida story to end the night. You never go wrong with a good Florida story. I'm going to say that right now. Never go wrong with it. <sighs> Greg Moyes, thank you so much for that awesome super chat, man. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Should say thank you to Flat Earth Fellow, Marty, Sig, Eric, Miss Pickles, Ed, Ashira, Cat Chaser, Greco, and Sweet Murray F for those awesome super chats. I really do appreciate it, everyone. I really do. Thank you so much for your love and support of this show. What the Florida? That is right, gorgeous Teresa. That is right. So anyways, you know, I, lo I know a lot of people and I read the comments and a lot of people will often say that, uh, that, you know, it's hard to believe and understand what Keith is saying. You know, the one thing that I always want, want you guys to know about, I don't even really need the headphones. And, yeah, yes, I do. I need it for the. Uh, the one thing that I always like to say is, you know, Keith works hard on getting what he does. And some people are going to absolutely love him. Some people aren't going to understand. But the one thing that I know about Keith, knowing him personally, is that he is a very honorable, honest guy. Thank you, Wendy Williams, for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. Much love back. Much love back. But the one thing that, you know, the beautiful part about this show and what we do with this segment is you have an opportunity to be entertained. You have an opportunity to believe or disbelieve. It's all up to you. All up to you. You know, Keith is just going by what he's experienced and what he's learned in his communication and with his uh, understanding of what's gone on with him. So that's what we need to do. That's all we do is just take it for what you feel it's worth, you know, and I love the guy. I've used the guy personally during my experiences. Keith really hasn't steered me wrong. So to me, I trust that. Add to the fact that he is a good dude, really, really good dude. And I hope each and every one of you get the opportunity to meet him one day to to know how good of a dude our Keith Andrews is because he is a very, very nice individual. And uh, I love the guy. I do. As long as I'm doing this show, Keith will have a 
uh, an opportunity to hang out here and do what he does because I have a lot of fun with him. And that's why I continue to bring him on. And I know you guys absolutely uh, love him too. And you may not understand it, but you love him too. So uh, that's the big thing. <laughs> Thanks, escaped. All right, here we go with the news, everyone. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, you can check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news, let's do this thing, shall we? The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the annoying. A really shrill sound is tormenting neighbors of a luxury condominium in Brooklyn, New York. The building at 347 Henry Street in Cobble Hill, marked as Five River Park, has been called the Whistling Condo by some, but others say the name really doesn't describe the maddening sound. Whistling can be pleasant. This is not pleasant. Amanda Sue Nichols, second vice president of the Cobble Hill Association, told the Brooklyn Eagle, she said the sound is like the metallic screech made by a breaking subway train. It has also been described as a screaming dinosaur standing on top of the building. The noise can be heard for blocks and is particularly irritating to neighbors who have been working from home during the pandemic. It has been pinpointed to the wind blowing through the building's balcony railings that is causing this. The building, formerly part of the Long Island College Hospital campus, is being developed by Fortis Property Group with 25 residences and three penthouses priced between $1.3 and $4.3 million. We responded immediately when we were made aware of the wind-related noise, and we have identified an adjustment to the balcony railings that we believe will remediate the issue, Fortis spokesman George Shea has stated. So yeah, apparently the building farts. Let's just be honest, the building farts. I love this new law in Japan because there is nothing that drives me bonkers more than watching people walk on an escalator. There's no point. That's why the escalator is moving for you. You don't need to walk. Just sit back and enjoy it. Anyways, a Japanese prefecture located north of Tokyo announced a new ordinance that will take effect October 1st requiring escalator passengers to stand in place while being transported up or down. The Saitama Prefectural Assembly enacted a draft ordinance that requires riders on escalators in the area to stand in place rather than attempt to walk up or down the escalator stairs while it's in motion. The measure was backed by the Liberal Democratic Party and one Canadian, me, the largest voting bloc in the assembly. We need to deliver a strong message to the public to alter practices that have become so pervasive as to be preconceived as custom. Shinichi Nakayashiki has said about this. Uh, uh, who doesn't love Shinichi's stance on this? I love it. The ordinance, which takes effect October 1st, calls on escalator operators to ensure users are informed of the rule by posting signs. The measure allows for the prefectural government to issue warnings to operators of escalators where users are seen violating the rule, but there are no penalties spe specified for violations. A report by the Japanese Elevator Association, look at that, 
they have an elevator association. An industry group said there were about 805 reported incidents of people being injured as a result of moving on escalators between January 2018 and December 2019. Ban it. Get rid of it. There's no need to walk on an escalator. No need whatsoever. Everything's provided for you. Just enjoy the ride. Can't stand those people. Really can't. Near the end, the battle... Uh, the battered American destroyer USS Johnson was surrounded by Japanese warships closing in to finish her off. The Johnson was ablaved, scores of sailors lay dead, and after three hours of heroic battle, one of its guns could return fire. At 9.45 a.m. on October 25, 1924, the wounded skipper, Commander Ernest E. Evans, gave the order to abandon ship, and 25 minutes later, the Johnson sank off the Philippines islands of Samar. Evans and 185 members of the crew were lost, and he would become the first Native American in the Navy to receive the Medal of Honor. Well, on Thursday, the Navy and a team of undersea explorers announced that the wreck of the Johnson has been positively identified in 21,180 feet of water. Scattered wreckage has been found at the site in 2019, but could not be positively identified. But late last month, a manned submersible operated by Caledon Oceanic, a Dallas undersea exploration company, located the front two-thirds of the ship, sitting upright along with the bridge, midsection, and the identified hull number 557. Submersible, piloted by former Navy Commander Victor Vescovo, also saw two large gun turrets, twin torpedo racks, and multiple gun mounts. No human remains or clothing were seen at any point during the dives, and nothing was taken from the wreck, Khaled instead. The wreck of the Johnson is a hallowed sight, said Rear Admiral Sam Cox, head of the Naval History and Heritage Command in Washington, it serves as a sobering reminder for today's sailors. After all that is asked of them in day-to-day -day service, they may one day be asked for far more. The Johnson was sunk during a huge naval battle in the Philippine uh, Sea as the United States was liberating the island nation from the Japanese and advancing the bloody drive across the Pacific theater that would end the war Ten months later, it was late October 1944, a powerful force of Japanese battleships and cruisers managed to catch the Navy off guard and jump a U.S. fleet of small aircraft carriers off Samar. The Johnson and other small destroyers assailed the Japanese force as carriers fled. According to historian Ian W. Toll, she was nearer to the enemy than any other American warship and therefore came in for a special attention from enemy gun gunners. Uh, he wrote in his recent book, Twilights of the Gods. Despite the barrage, the destroyer charged away. I intend to go into harm's way, Evans said, when the Johnson was commissioned in 1943. Anyone who doesn't want to go for, a long, for the ride had better get off this ship right now. Evans was from Pawnee, Oklahoma. His mother was Cherokee, and his father was half white and half Creek Indian. Despite the racism of the era, he was admitted to the Naval Academy, graduating in 1931. He was 36 at the time of the attack, and he had been the Johnson's only skipper. God bless him. God bless him. A pressure vessel from the SpaceX 9 Falcon rocket stage fell onto a man's farm in Washington State last week, leaving a four-inch dent in the soil. The Black Composite Overwrap Pressure Vessel, or COPV, was a remnant from the alien invasion-looking breakup of Falcon 9 Second Stage over Oregon and Washington March 26. The stage re-entered the atmosphere in an unusual spot in the sky after sending a payload of SpaceX Starlink satellites to orbit. A Grant County, Washington property owner who told authorities he didn't want to be identified found the errant COPV, roughly the size and shape of a heavy punching bag, sitting on his farm one morning last weekend. He reported it to police, and they went and picked it up. Neither the property owner nor the sergeant are rocket scientists, of course, but judging from what had happened a few days prior, well... They believe it's from the Falcon 9 re-entry. So the sergeant called SpaceX, which confirmed the GCO it appeared to be theirs, and dispatched employees to retrieve the new COPB that landed on the ground. Yeah, it was a nice dent, actually. Nice dent in the ground. you think it would be bigger than about four inches after falling, like, miles from space? But no. No, not at all. 
Of course, we didn't have a protocol for this, said the police, so we just erred on the side of returning someone's property to them. A COPV is a small part of the Falcon 9 second stage, the smaller section of the rocket that detaches from the main stage and the edge of space and boosts satellites farther from Earth. The COPV stores helium at pressures of nearly 6,000 psi, which is used to pressurize the second stage large tanks of propellant. Let's move on. Former employee of a Kansas-based water treatment facility is facing decades in prison after he allegedly having broke into its computer system two years ago. Wyatt A. Travnicek, who's only 22, is accused of gaining unauthorized access to the internal workings of the Ellsworth Rural Water District. Why? Well, uh, let's just say it was Travnicek who redesigned from the plant or resigned from the plant not long ago before the incident, allegedly used that access to remotely disable the processes responsible for cleaning and disaffecting its water supply. Well, that's not very nice. It's unclear why he would want to do this. Nonetheless, he now faces two federal charges, tampering with a public water system and reckless damage to a protected computer during unauthorized access. If convicted, he could face up to 25 years in prison. While the indictment doesn't give an exact accounting of how he supposedly disrupted the facility's operations, all signs point to an abuse of its remote access control system, the software commonly used to monitor and manipulate operational systems from afar. Why would this Travincheck think this is a good idea? Look, if you want revenge, you know, write a letter. Pick up a protest sign. Don't poison people make them sick. You're never going to get away with that. Well, speaking of art, a South Korean couple mistakenly tarnished a half a million dollar American artwork when they painted over it as they see as seen in a cringeworthy clip on social media these days. They thought they were allowed to do that as participatory art and made a mistake, said Kang Wook head of the exhibition at Seoul's Lotte World Mall, where the accidental vandalism took place. The damages are like 95 by 275 inch untitled piece was painted by Paris-based artist Joe One, a.k.a. Harlem-born John Andrew Perello, before a live audience in 2016. It was valued at $500,000. Arranged in front of the abstract opus were the paint cans and brushes used in its creation. They're considered part of the art piece, which may have given an aforementioned pair the wrong impression. Indeed, CCTV footage shows the impromptu impressionist picking up the tools and adding their own dashes of paint to the work a la Joker's Museum makeover in 1989's Batman. The clip concludes with a close-up of the re-image or reimagined artwork, which now sports three ugly black splotches. After reviewing the clip, authorities apprehended the vandal goes. Oh, come on, let's get rid of the puns here. However, they subsequently turned them loose when the gallery decided not to press charges as a graffiti job appeared to be an innocent mistake. We are currently in discussions with the artist about whether to restore it, said Kang of the damaged display. The artist didn't return any media requests. In the meantime, they have cordoned off the exhibit with wire fencing and put up a do not touch sign to deter others from adding their own taglines. Half a million, all because they didn't like art. Good Canadian kid here. An Ontario boy became a Guinness World Record holder after a baby tooth pulled by his dentist was measured at 1.02 inches long. Nine-year-old Luke Bolton of Peterborough received word from Guinness that his tooth, removed by Dr. Chris MacArthur of Liftlock Family Dentistry, earned the record for the world's largest milk tooth extracted. Bolton's family said the tooth was removed September 17, 2019, when the boy was eight years old, but they had only recently learned that their application for the world record had been accepted and they have not yet received an official certificate. It was a bit disturbing at first to think that was in someone's mouth, Craig said. He's the boy's father. When he first saw the extracted tooth, he said, but it was pretty impressive. Bolton's son, Luke's older sister, Leah, suggested the tooth could be a world record. Luke said he's planning to get have his tooth displayed with his certificate once it arrives from Guinness. Couple more here for you. I don't know what's with animals these days. 
they've been doing some pretty stupid things. There was the deer that crashed through the barbershop window. We have beavers trying to cross Highway 1 in Toronto. Well, a Connecticut woman received a shock of a lifetime when a turkey crashed through a window and left a path of destruction through their home. This is the second turkey this week, by the way. Sammy Ganias of West Norwalk said that she and her daughter, Scarlett, were making a dessert pizza when they heard something. It was a turkey smashing through the dining room window. Right before we saw a couple of turkeys walking around the yard, two minutes later, one threw, flew right through the window. I didn't know what was happening. I saw a turkey on the floor, heard glass breaking. It was so loud. It was like a movie when someone crashed through a window. Ganaya said the turkey fought with her, Jack Russell Terrier named Carolyn, and rampaged through the kitchen, living room, and dining room while her husband Jason attempted to catch it. No way. I guarantee you he was filming this. He had to be. He wasn't trying to catch it. This is serious stuff. They ended up calling the police department for help. Officer Andrew showed up, responded to the home, and he and Jason were able to capture the turkey using a blanket and a recycling bin, took it outside where it was released. There were no injuries to the human or canine residents of the home, and the turkey left on its own accord. However, the family is now suing the turkey for breaking and entering, and they want their window replaced. Here's another dumb animal, another deer story. A deer crashed through the windshield of a Virginia school bus and landed on a student who was taking a nap during the morning commute. Powhatan County Public Schools shared footage from the vehicle's onboard camera, which was captured at 6 a.m. this past Thursday. The footage shows the bus in transit doing its own thing, minding its own business, when a deer decides that it's going to leap through the windshield on the opposite side of where the driver is seated and flips over a seating barrier to land on a student who is sleeping. The bus opens the door, the deer runs out, the footage shows. The driver then calls for an assistance and states that the vehicle was on Route 13 near Anderson Highway. The student, by the way, was not injured. That's good news. The driver said the deer ran off into the distance, did not appear to be hurt. Brian Bartlett, the district's interim director of transportation, praised the driver's actions during the incident. He did very well. He was able to get the bus off to the side of the road safely, turned the four ways on while the bus was moving, and did all of his while the deer was still on the floor of the bus, kicking all around. He did a very good job at keeping the bus safe and keeping the kids on the bus safe as well. He's just lucky that deer didn't go through the driver's side. That would have been a whole different situation. Now let's head over to Florida because it's been a while since Florida man or Florida woman have really impressed us. But this is a good one. Usually the gloves are off when it comes to a playground brawl. In this case... Only one glove was off. A 34-year-old woman from Jacksonville was arrested and charged with one count of child abuse with personal special weapons after she allegedly showed up to her daughter's middle school prepared to fight another student with one boxing glove on. Yes, Edith Riddle showed up to beat up a little kid with one boxing glove on to attend a meeting with a vice principal over her daughter's violent outburst. When asked why she was wearing the glove on her hand, Riddle reportedly said it was glued on and couldn't be removed. After the meeting, Riddle allegedly went to the school's cafeteria with her daughter, who went to egg another student to fight her. Yeah, egg on the student. Cops say Riddle's daughter pushed the student to the ground and unleashed a fury of punches. Not wanting to miss out on the fun, the mother jumps in and laid in some haymakers with the glove as well. The victim suffered cuts to her forearms and knees, was sent to hospital for evaluation. What are these people thinking down there? <laughs> Come on. Like, this stuff, people, you cannot make up. I hope they get jail time, and I hope they get sued by the other kids' parents. <laughs> Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. Tell me your thoughts on whether or not aliens are from outer space or time travelers from our future. Uriah, why does it have to be either or? Can't they be both? 
Maybe I think they are an intrinsic part of our reality. They live and share aspects of it with us and always have done. As we evolve, I think we'll be able to learn to understand and see more of them. 13 ballads. If I'm an alien taxpayer doing 9 to 5 to get the mothership across light years of space, I want the trip to have decent goals and a purpose. Anthony thinks both are okay. And let's go to Captain Nostis. Both. Maybe their evolution is our future. And to others, we are from space too. Joseph's wondering, why can't it be both, Dave? Why? It was just a question, man. Uh, Marty, picture of both based on reports from various experiencers and investigators such as Grant Cameron. Teresa thinks it's both. It's complicated, but I was with beings, 2014, who could bend time and manipulate molecular structures and go through walls and change dimensions of your room. It's one hell of a night. I want that party. Pascal, above time? Adriano, probably from the deep outer space, but they probably live longer than we do and are far more advanced in a lot of ways, especially when it comes to reproducing. John, possibly both, but could also be other explanations from where they come from as well. Angela believes time is exempt for those so inclined the natural laws of nature do not apply. Well, let's go on here. Rock the Gaspar. Neither. I don't think it's planetary visitation. I think it's far deeper and more profound. But what do I know as I've never had an experience? Davy? Well, we already read yours. Joe? Aliens from space for the simple fact there's years of t ahead of technology and they are way ahead of us. But by now... How much in years in evolution, I wonder? 20, 50, 100,000 years ahead? Sparkles. I believe they can be both, being from outer space, possibly being the most accurate. Sir Can, no to both, but space and time travel are not too different. It's space-time. Danny, I think they are from our future. The glyphs of the pyramids and elsewhere shows modern spacesuits and vehicles. Filth. I'm going to go with aliens from space. If they can time travel, you can think they can undo all the times Carl crashed a UFO into the Earth. I swear that alien probably has the most expensive insurance going. Thank you to everybody participating in the thought of the day. Thank you to Captain Shirk and to our Keith Andrews for the ET connection. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in, at work, at home, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Facebook, Spreaker, the Space Travelers Club, and to all the Derek and Derekettes hanging out at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night, but soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. million armies of one bite you all helena wants to bite us all want to take a ride cut us all all right hang out guys i'm gonna be up here for a while i think i'm gonna update the website so if you guys want to hang out i'll keep the chat room going while i'm updating the website for 
uh, next week because I don't want to do it tomorrow. I have too much going on. Thanks, Duke. How you doing, buddy? And uh, thank you so much to the gorgeous Jennifer Richardson Elizaldi for the super chat. Really do appreciate that. I'll be right back. Stay right, stay here because uh, we're going to play a little bit when we get back. Going to have to. And when I get back, if you guys have any questions uh, for me, I will ask them and answer them. So, yeah, be right back. Ah, it's the work that never ends, people. The work that never ends. Ain't that the truth? <clears throat> Let's hang out, have some fun. Go from there. Shall we? Let's. All right. Remember, if you have any questions, put them in capital letters. I'll do my best to answer them. 
If you uh, have any guest requests, send them over to our uh, bookings at spacedoutradio.com. That's bookings at spacedoutradio.com, where Corrin's the booking guy can get on him. He'll get on him. He's that guy. He's totally that guy. And we love Corrin's the booking guy around here. We do. We totally do. Cut that. Good. That. So I'm hoping that tomorrow night I can record this second uh, episode of uh, SOR's True Tales. Uh, I put the last one out just to see what kind of reaction that we would get. And I'm so thankful for the overwhelmingly positive response that we got on it. I was really hoping that we were doing that, that we would get that. And uh, you guys... Uh, uh, never cease to amaze me. Those who listen in and who've commented on it have been viewed a few hundred times already. And I think it's going to be uh, a real important thing that we do because as we move forward, they're going to be your experiences with your voice on them. And so I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping that we could do that. Uh, Tales, T-A-L-E-S. T, thank you so much. J.C. Johnson, I only got the chance to interview him uh, once or twice. Uh, he was such a nice man. I'll tell you, very cordial, cordial very honorable. Uh, he taught so many people in this field. And uh, when he passed away a couple of years ago, we lost a good one there. We definitely lost a good one. You know, but such a nice man. Uh, I love him. And... Uh, he reminds me a lot, or I would say the second coming of J.C. Johnson would be David Weatherly. David Weatherly, it's weird because to me, I, and maybe I'm in the minority here, but him and David Weatherly, to me, really looked a lot alike. And uh, David Weatherly, I cannot speak highly enough of him. Uh, so, kind of cool. Who's got a thumbs up for me? So we or we need two thumbs up. I'm at 98. I need 99 and 100. Who, who's got two thumbs up for me? Who's got two thumbs up so we can have 100 tonight? Can I get two more? Is that too much to ask? Oh, there's 102. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Mm hmm. We were at 98. So, normally I do the website on uh, Saturday nights, updating for the coming week, but I, I know that tomorrow I've got a lot of things I need to do. Um, and somewhere I got to find time for my blog. And I need to, I'm going to take uh, my boy out into the forest tomorrow. We'll spend a few hours out there. And uh, up here, they're doing an Easter egg hunt for kids. So my son's going to go enjoy that. So I got a real busy day tomorrow. So that's why I'm thinking I'll just do the website tonight and uh, just get it over and done with. So that way I don't need to worry about it. It never ends, people. The job never ends. Yeah. So, that's cool. Probably could have done more today if I hadn't uh, slept for three hours. <laughs> but, 
Hey, what do you do? I guess I must have needed it. Yeah, so... Um, if you haven't checked out our True Tales, they're nice short stories. Uh, I did. I started it last week. Uh, it is... Uh, I know I'm tired because I'm scratching my head. Uh, but check it on out. Let me know what you uh, think of in the comments down below. That'd be really cool. And uh, kind of go from there. But uh, yeah, we're definitely going to uh, get some stuff done. It's going to be fun. Where's the dead air? Uh, did you see? Jenny, I didn't see that. Are you talking the audio is off for me? Shouldn't be. Can you not hear me? Thirteen past midnight is really cool. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you for that, gorgeous Teresa. Oh, uh, that's probably because, um, my computer where my audio is running through needs a Windows update, and I really didn't want to do that uh, through the show or before the show because sometimes those Microsoft updates can really throw a wrench into things. So I try and do them afterward, and uh, that's probably why. Thanks for letting me know, Jenny.
All right. Well. What's happening, Big Bad Duke? What are you up to? You're causing troubles again there, big man? <laughs> oh, I love you, man. Is that spelt again? Let's open that up. Excuse me one second here, please. Six. Give me two seconds, people. What are we talking about here? What am I missing? What am I missing? Fill me in with the juice, people. Fill me in with the juice. 
Painted ladybugs, man. Painted ladybugs. Fun. Fun. Cool. So we got Monday and Tuesday done. This one's been oh. totally out for a while.
right. Wednesday. Oh, Stan Gordon. Very nice. Very nice. Stan Gordon. God, that's strong. Go back here because I forgot a step. Who's Bunny? Who's Bunny, Joe? Hey, UFO Knot. How you doing, man? Sorry if I'm a little preoccupied. <clears throat> trying to do a bunch of stuff at once here. Can't believe there's still 56 people watching. Kind of cool. Dirty filth, what's going on? I got some mail from you. You're killing me, man. You are killing me. Friggin' love it. It's done. Come on, yes. Uh, I haven't been covering Mars UFO not. Uh, hey, Ed Claydor, you're watching my beard grow back. Uh, slowly but surely. Uh, but back to UFO dot. Uh, I'm kind of burnt out of the UFO topic right now. And, and in the month of May, we're going to go pretty hard on UFOs once again, because we're going to be pushing towards that June 1st deadline. And then after June 1st, we're going to probably hit it hard again. So it's going to be wild to see kind of what happens uh, over the next little bit. So I've kind of been taking a break. And, and the way, you know, there's so much shit on Twitter and, and people 
spewing and spouting everything. I just like, honestly, I get overwhelmed at times. So kind of what I'm thinking. So I'm just kind of taking a break from it. Will you do a Steve? Uh, yeah, I would probably do a um, an episode on, you know, like a Saturday night special with him or something. I don't know. Um, once we get the new website up, I am going to be doing certain interviews with with people uh, for the website only that you have to be a space travelers fan with. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. Drones are back. Very cool. It's the eighth, right? Oh, I know. And the last one. Friday next Friday is going to be awesome. Paul Hynek, the son of J. Allen Hynek, will be joining us.
Give me two seconds, people. That's not what I want. That's what I want. That work. Almost done here, people. That's done, so we should have events. Let me go back here. 
much I can spell. I'm missing some stuff here. All right. Uh, I haven't had Paul Hynek on the show for two years. Over two years. So we're bringing him back on. Yeah, I saw that uh, Greenwald had James Wolsey on. Well, thank you, Amy Vegas O. Amy Vegas O will be partying with us in Vegas once the border opens up. I think I got the whole website thing done here. If I did, I'm pretty impressed that I did it that quickly. Uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Look at that. Got the website done, which means that Facebook should be done. Check out events. Sure, that's all confirmed. All right, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There it is. Looking good. Looking good. Close that out. Do, 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 do. Well, people, I am going to bed. I got a very long day ahead tomorrow. It is going to be wild. We're going to rip it up in the snow and mud. I'm going to get dirty. Going to get dirty. Maybe seen some Sasquatch tracks. Who knows? Uh, but we're going to see how far we can push it tomorrow. It's going to be fun. We're probably going to need a winch or two. That's okay. That's what it's there for. And so thank you to all of our um, great super chatters tonight. Let's uh, rifle them off once again. Uh, starting with Murray, Greco, Cat Chaser, Ashira, Ed, Miss Pickles, Eric, Sig Sauer, Marty, Flatfellow, Greg Moyes, Wendy, and the final one to Jennifer Richardson, Elizaldi. I really appreciate the love, everyone. I really do. And uh, you guys are so important to what we do on a nightly basis. It really, truly means a lot. And I have a lot of fun with you guys. I really do. Thank you to our brand new subscribers this week. All of the veterans who listen to this show because we absolutely love our veterans around here. And, uh, you know, you guys do an amazing job in keeping us safe. You guys all have a great long weekend. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. Much love to all of you, and uh, you guys take care. We'll see you Monday night, and uh, God, I can't even. Uh, William Lunsford, William Lunsford will be our guest, where we are talking about Bigfoot and the Falk monster. We're gonna have a lot of fun. You guys take care. We'll see you all very, very soon, everyone. Take care. <laughs>